Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the astrological forecast for the entire month of June of 2023. Joining me today are astrologers Austin Kopic and Kira Taborn. Hey, welcome, both of you. Hey, Chris. Hello. Thanks for joining me. So we're going to start by, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of the month ahead, just a brief preview of what we're going to be talking about here at the top of the episode. Then we're going to transition into talking about news and recent events for the first hour of the episode. And then later in the second hour, we'll get into a full detailed breakdown of the month ahead forecast for June. So people can go uh, either to the podcast website or to the YouTube channel, and I'll put timestamps if you want to jump ahead to different segments of the show. Uh, but otherwise, let's go ahead and jump right into it by looking at the planetary alignments calendar for the month of June. All right, so here's the overview. On June 3rd, we get our first lunation of the month, which is a full moon in the sign of Sagittarius. Uh, the very next day, Mercury conjoins Uranus in the sign of Taurus. Then Venus ingresses into Leo on the 5th of June, which is important because Venus is actually going to go retrograde in that sign this summer and therefore spend an extended period of time going through that sector of the sky. So this ingress is more important than usual because it's in some ways the early onset of the Venus retrograde period. Then later in the month on the 11th, Mercury ingresses into the sign of Gemini and goes into its home sign, and Pluto retrogrades back into Capricorn after spending the past few months in the sign of Aquarius. Then later at the end of that week on the 17th of June, Saturn stations retrograde for the very first time in the sign of Pisces, and then it's going to retrograde back into early Pisces before stationing direct later this year. On the 20th, we get our second lunation of the month, which is a new moon in the sign of Gemini. Then the sun moves into Cancer on the 21st, Mercury into Cancer on the 26th. And finally, at the very end of the month, Neptune stations retrograde in late Pisces on June 30th. So those are some of the main sort of major alignments that we're going to be talking about during the course of this episode, um, among others. Um, but yeah, so let's go ahead and transition into the news segment of the show and first welcome you both on. So hey, Austin, hey, Kira. Kira, thanks for joining us for, uh, you've been on the podcast before, but this is your first time joining us as a co-host for the forecast episode. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm stoked to be here. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you're here. We were we were gonna maybe do a podcast last year, um, but that that fell apart. So I'm yeah, excited to have yeah. you here. Yeah, and I will at some point tap you for that again <laughs> once I get around to it. Yeah, just let me know. <laughs> and and we did the Scorpio episode together of the Zodiac series along with our friend Sam Reynolds last year, and that was one of my favorite um, entries in the entire. And I say that with much bias of the entire Zodiac <laughs> series, but it was a really <clears throat> good episode. I mean, oh, right. I forgot. Oh, yeah. Usually when I have somebody and I say that I don't have like one of the other hosts of the other <laughs> sign um, on at the same time. Pisces was also a good episode. Yeah, and Pisces was one well. of my favorites. So well, thank you. And we we talked a lot about, um, uh, you know, the, the good relations between the, the nations of Pisces and Scorpio mm -hmm. and right. points yeah. of agreement. You know, what's really funny about that is I forgot to um, repeat a funny anecdote that my Pisces friend mentioned that I actually mentioned in the episode with Kira in the Scorpio episode, which is a Pisces Scorpio dynamic where uh, my Pisces friend will sometimes say if they meet a Scorpio just to get on their nerves, they'll say it's not that serious. And that's the <laughs> like Pisces thing to say to get on the nerves of a Scorpio. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I will use that. <laughs> you it may or may not work on me because I'm a I am a Pisces rising. So yeah, yeah. No, I, right. I mean, yeah, it's the art of implying that. Yeah. You know, exactly. Yeah. So that secret yeah. weapon that was by Micah, the astrologer Micah. So just shout out to Micah. So all right. So let's um how have you been, Austin, since we checked in last month? Um, well, so before we got on the, the public side of the call, I, I was describing myself as a tube of toothpaste with just a little bit left and I was having to roll it up to get anything out. Um, and I realized that that's literally how I started my day. I realized that my tube of toothpaste was almost gone. I had to pick the like crusted like caulk um, uh, out to get any toothpaste. So that's how I am. Um nice. <clears throat> And uh, that's because this um, this paired 
Mercury retrograde with the eclipses with Mars and Cancer was a triple whammy. And so we had um my parents of my parents were scheduled to come for the first time in years and then had to reschedule so that they would arrive right in the middle of the Mercury retrograde. And it was absolutely worth it to see them, but it was terrible timing in general because I've I've had so much prep to do for Norwak and our cat decided to have go on a death spiral um, of like rapid unexplained health decline in the middle of that. And uh, I believe it was the day after Mercury Station Direct um, a, 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 a that came, a, we got a vet to come to the house and who just who recommended uh, who recommended was a heroic dose uh, she referred to as a hail mary dose of prednisone, and then suddenly the cat was uh, this is our elder cat bear um, went from being given days to live by the previous vet to being you know just kind of old and it's got some conditions to manage but totally fine totally present and so all that's you know um, the kitty uh, uh, potential kitty in mortal danger you know, the, the joy and pressure of having your parents stay in your house and you haven't seen them for, you know, for years, the lots of work to do. And Kate, Kate's also got a huge project that she's working on. So it's just been, it's you, it's, it's required a lot of toothpaste, Chris. Um. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, thank you for scraping yourself off the bottom of the barrel in order to come join us today, given that. And I know you said you're having like a Mars transit to your Jupiter oh. and that was part of your like astrological correlate for that. Yeah. So the, um, so I'm in a Jupiter ruled year and Jupiter is uh, the ruler of the sixth, right? So six is where we see pets. And so the <clears throat> for most of May, uh, Mars was getting closer and closer to a conjunction with my Jupiter, right? As the ruler of the six, it's a malefic, a fallen malefic trying to kill my cat. Um, Kate had the eclipses hit Kate's sixth. So that was uh, uh, hard stuff for pets for her and the the kitty almost death spiral actually began within a day of the solar eclipse and um with the mercury retrograde right we just had the you know there's the parents rescheduled um is a good example of a mercury retrograde and um it was also the the endless vet visits that disagreed with each other and didn't gave us potentially actively incorrect information um you know we didn't get we didn't get the right prescription until mercury was basically direct um mm -hmm. so all everything was uh all, all of the the big stars of may's astrology <laughs> uh showed up and it's funny because last month you know when we were talking about all this i was like i just want to get to like middle end of the month i know it'll be fine right. then and i i found myself clinging to that um during the beginning of the month but um, that's how it happened. Things are fine. Kitty's been great for almost a week now. Um, uh, got almost everything done for Norwalk. Had a lovely visit with the parents. You know, all's well that ends well. But that was, uh, yeah, that was that was quite the uh, that was quite the tunnel. Yeah, it's nice to get to the other side of eclipse season, and now we've started to have non-eclipse lunations and get out of the Mercury retrograde and everything else and starting to transition into a new new phase of the year. All right, so in terms of major news and stuff, since the last time we did a forecast about a month ago, so one of the major things was that Pluto stationed um, retrograde in Aquarius for the very first time um, since it ingressed into the Aquarius right at the beginning of the month on May 1st, and that was right in the middle of the Mercury retrograde. And I know there was at least a couple of major news stories that occurred then. Um, one of them that was notable, and I won't spend too much time on it because I know I've talked about it a lot lately, but the AI researcher Jeffrey Hinton left Google uh, right, I think, within a day of that Pluto station. It may have been announced on the day of the Pluto station um, and he was like one of the leading AI researchers and some people are calling him like the father of AI or something like that. And um, he left and then went on this like publicity tour about how he was really concerned about where things were headed and that he was like had real concerns that this could be like a problem that was developing um, in the future with all of these companies starting to pull out all the road roadblocks in order to develop this technology quickly that could in some instances have negative impacts. 
And I thought that was really striking that it happened right on that station. And not long after that, just a few days later, a bunch of um, CEOs of major AI companies um, met up for a meeting at the White House. Um, and the Vice President Kamala Harris said that they have, quote, a moral obligation to develop AI safely. And that was on Thursday, May 4th. So just, again, like right within the vicinity of the orb of that Pluto station in Aquarius. And that seems so important to me because this is the first, that was the very first Pluto station in Aquarius. And there's going to be 38 of those because we're talking about Pluto transiting through Aquarius over the next 20 years. So getting one uh, preview and like paying attention to some events that were happening during that time frame seems important because it could foreshadow some events coming up in the future. Yeah. Can I plug your episode? Sure. <laughs> Astrology and um, artificial intel intelligence because um, it was really good. And yeah, I remember you guys talking about the um, the Pluto stations and this first one being so, you know, it's so big and yeah, I don't know. It's 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 really exciting to see. I mean, it's kind of scary also, but um, it's exciting to see how this Pluto ingress has been so clearly, you know, about AI. Of course, it's going to be about other things too. But yeah, it's been it's been really interesting to watch. Yeah, for sure. And I did that as the four hundredth episode because usually I'll do like a retrospective and look back into you know, some of my favorite episodes or how different episodes went in the past hundred episodes. But for that episode, I decided to get together with Nikki and Best and talk about AI and some of the stuff that's happening and that's emerging and where it's heading. And we also tried to look into the future to look at some major alignments over the next 20 years of Pluto and Aquarius and see if this hypothetical thing of them creating artificial general intelligence, which is what most of the AI companies are trying to do right now, which is create human level versatile intelligence and machines if that's possible when that might happen and we were looking at some of the different alignments that were could correlate with that in the future and i was zeroing in on like 2033 and 2040 also especially which is the uranus neptune square around that time frame in wow. 20 2033 is the, was is that Saturn conjunct Uranus in Gemini in a trine with Pluto in Aquarius? Exactly. And Jupiter's yeah. also in Aquarius. It's just gone into Aquarius. And it's oh. just like, it's the tail end of Uranus in Gemini, which, you know, I'm sure we're just going to see such an acceleration of different technologies and transportation because, you know, the last time we had that was World War II. And you just imagine like how fast technology started to accelerate during that time frame and us seeing something similar coming up over the next decade when Uranus goes into Aquarius in, you know, what, just a couple of years, two or three year, years now. Um, so that 2033 time frame will just be the tail end of that. So we'll see some of the final results um, of things coming through at that time. And I think that's a good time frame for some major technological changes. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you're yeah, Uranus, uh, Uranus in Gemini and also Uranus in Aquarius, whether it rules it or not, um, it's very strong there. And sure, we get technology that's not specifically for killing people, but there is a lot of specifically for killing people technology that Uranus brings. Um, right. The previous Uranus in Gemini or the, the Uranus in Gemini previous to World War II, right? Civil War. It wasn't widely used, but that's uh, uh, the machine gun, like a fully automatic um, gun. Like that's when the Gatling gun um, was developed and deployed to some degree. Um, you know, there there have been rifles for a while, but no machine guns uh, until the 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 U.S. is uh, the U.S. is Civil War, and then Uranus in Aquarius was World War One. Right, which was planes for the first time, tanks for the first time, um, like artillery with chemical weapons like uh, mustard gas and all that. And then, you know, our last Uranus and Aquarius did did bring it did bring everyone the internet, um, but you also had a lot of military technologies that were deployed for the first time in the um, the Second Gulf War. Yeah, well, and it's also hard oh, to ooh, ooh, one sorry and um, the. Uh, you know, the the first atomic or the only atomic bombs to be used in a military context were used with Mars conjunct Uranus in Gemini last time. Mm. 
Yeah, well, and it's hard to, as I talked about in episode 376, it's hard to disentangle this period coming up the next decade from this also being the Uranus return of the United States when it goes through Gemini and how that's coincided with those three periods in the past of like the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and then World War II. Um, so yeah, that's also a little nervous making, but there's that. Oh, sorry. One more nerdy historical military fact. So the Revolutionary War, um, the rife, uh, um, and bigger nerds, feel free to correct me, but I believe that one of the big things in the Revolutionary War in terms of equipment was that rifling barrels was a new thing. When you rifle the barrels uh, of uh, of a gun, the bullets are much more accurate and are much better at their job, and that that was a new thing. It increases the, I, think, I believe it increased the range, uh, the uh, the effective range of um, uh, of of gunpowder weapons quite a bit, and that changed tactics. It allowed um, guerrilla tactics to be much more effective because you could strike from a greater distance, which if you're trying to, you know, shoot and run away, um, the greater distance you can do that, the better. Well, that makes sense. Uh, fitting with that is actually a new story I've forgotten, just remembered now as you're going on about major technological innovations in warfare, but um, also around the Pluto station, another one that I, I remembered and took note of at the time, I think it was around May 3rd or so, um, there were those two, th that drone attack basically on the Kremlin where there were these two drones and there was videos of them that like dive bombed the Kremlin and, and were mm -hmm. destroyed. So I don't think they did any major damage, but it was one of the first really notable uses of like drones to in, in an offensive way in that way on, on like the seat of, of power of like another capital of like another country in some sense. I mean, maybe there's been other stuff, but that was also a little suggestive as well, uh, potentially not in a great way. Yeah, well, no doubt the, you know, probably the tactics and the thinking behind that came out of the last year uh, in Ukraine. Um, you know, the we, we talked about this, one of the major sort of military outcomes of Mars spending so long in Gemini is drones in a variety of different roles are just part of warfare now for everybody. Both sides use them, use them again, like not just in one role that but for surveillance, for artillery spotting, uh, for doing uh, suicide drones for kind of ominously and hilariously they they've equipped a lot of um a lot of civilian models so they just have like a little grabber and they'll just drop grenades on positions you just fly your drone over and harass vertically um and so that's you know it it, it hasn't changed everything right it's not like a whole new ball game um it's just part of the basic um you know, it's like part of the the basic collection of forces every army is going to need from now on yeah well um so that was the first pluto station and we have got approximately here's the list you can actually generate a list of that in um on astroseek which is pretty cool and here's all the pluto stations that we have over the next 20 years in aquarius i, I was wondering if you literally counted all of them or if <laughs> yeah. a machine helped you <laughs> I got out like an ephemeris. I should have said mm -hmm. that. I got out an ephemeris and just <laughs> sat there and like counted through the next 20 years. No, I'm I'm lazy and I use technology to my advantage. <laughs> and that's what a good Aquarius rising does. So um, yeah, 400 episodes and just briefly aside, um, thanks everyone for listening for 400 episodes. Like it's been an interesting journey since 2012 when I started this. And um, yeah, Austin, thanks for participating, doing all these forecasts with me. We're about to hit the eight-year anniversary, the Venus retrograde anniversary of starting that this summer. And um, Kira, you've also been like a longtime um, listener and fan and participant of the podcast, as well as a fellow podcaster yourself. So um, yeah, it's been interesting how, hitting that milestone. Yeah, congrats to you. It's it's wild. I mean, I've mentioned it before when I've been on the podcast, but I think I started listening in like 2014 and um yeah it's crazy that that was nine years ago and now I'm on the podcast so right <laughs> yeah, yeah congrats on 400 plus thank you um and I know uh so Kira you had mentioned also there was another news story that was happening around the time of the Pluto station uh which was the writer's strike happened and you had something you you thought that that was tied into as well 
Yeah, I was thinking, you know, writers are obviously symbolized by Mercury. And um, we have that station so close to Uranus and thinking about all the strikes we, we've seen going on around the world over the past couple of years, they've been closely tied to the Saturn Uranus squares. Um, and so I figured that this Mercury retrograde station with Uranus is probably also tied to the to the writer strike. And Austin had pointed out like it's happening in this Venus ruled sign and we're talking about creative industries um, so yeah, I'm curious to see what happens when Mercury finally clears that um, that shadow and makes that conjunction with Uranus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. And there was there's another um, the the other piece about it is, and I don't I haven't studied this exhaustively, but from what I've heard about the writers' strike, one of the conditions that the writers are pushing for is that um, their studios, the employers, don't. Uh, don't use AI or promise not to use AI to replace writer labor. Um, and so Mercury's not exactly square Pluto, but it's in a squared sign, right? They have their angular relative to each other. And Mercury's direct station was pretty close, like first middle of the first decan of Taurus, right? Pluto in the first decan of Aquarius. And just, you know, I doubt, I don't, I sincerely doubt that there's ever been a large scale negotiation in an industry where um, AI was one of the key conditions. So that just kind of ties, it shows you like Pluto tying in now to that, like to what's been going on in the fixed signs, right? That that Uranus and Taurus and, and labor um, has been such a consistent theme, but now we have the Pluto and Aquarius theme, right? Yeah, that's such yeah. a good point. Yeah, and just major transformations and major like inevitable transformations, because that's you know probably just the tip of the iceberg of many other industries that are going through similar things right now and having similar tensions in terms of all of a sudden this technology is being implemented and um and, and threatens like a lot of different jobs and stuff and a lot of different jobs and and careers and fields are going to change as a result of that right and yeah. in a way like and it's an uncertain threat maybe it threatens this maybe it doesn't maybe it does threaten it but not for 20 years maybe it threatens mm -hmm. it next year maybe they never you know maybe it can never do that right it's almost more ominous to say they might be coming for you than they're definitely coming for you mm -hmm. yeah because right. how do you plan <laughs> right who knows yes that's a good point well, good to keep paying attention to stuff in the early phases of this, since the early phases of a transit sometimes give that like preview or that little inkling of things to come. So we'll have to pay attention to that. Yeah, um, just on that real quick, Chris, I I, I mm -hmm. feel like, you know, like the, there's a little, when you have a planet that does a toe dip ingress mm -hmm. and comes in, you know, just, this is just for two months and then pops back into the previous sign, but with an I'll be back. Right. It's sort of like, I'm just going to leave this here. Right? right. And you can talk about this. Right. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, we need to do this ethically and safety. This could go really wrong. It's just enough of a, of a, you know, a potential threat that it's, you got to think about it, but it's not, it's not fully formed. It's hard to um, articulate a full response, but I'm just going to leave this here and I'll be back in, you know, six months. That's and really we'll talk funny. Again. Like that's well, exactly the, feeling of this and that's exactly the timing of the ingress and regress that's really funny because that's you know that's like the exact line of that arnold schwarzenegger yeah. became famous for in like the terminator and he looks around and he just says i'll be back and that is the ominous thing and then he like a few minutes later crashes his car through the uh police station and starts killing everyone i didn't know that i never seen it <laughs> never seen the terminator Oh, man. I haven't seen a lot of movies, but that okay. that line makes even more sense now. I, I love that. I would yeah. I I would just watch Terminator 2. And if you like that, watch the first one. Terminator 2 is widely regarded as the best. It's a very entertaining movie, if nothing else. Cool. Um, but what's interesting, Tra you know. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We can't transition from there really quickly. Uh, that's true in Terminator 2 is the superior one, but there's a big twist in Terminator 2 that you can't actually understand properly unless you watch Terminator 1. Okay. So I recommend still watching <laughs> 1 in order to... All right, all right. Now make your transition, Austin. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I was just going to say, you know, the it's interesting because Pluto and Aquarius is bringing up all of the uh, horror stories we have about the future. 
um, that we told, you know, that some of which like Terminator or some of which were told during previous Saturn and Aquarius periods. Um, but, you know, Terminator, for those of you who have seen it, um, there might be some spoilers. It's they've been out for 35 and 40 years. Um, um, but when people talk about Skynet, like the the apocalypse to be avoided in Terminator is literally AI takes over. Um, and, you know, we have that in a dozen other franchises and novels. It and becomes so, like sentient and then recognizes humanity as an enemy, as a threat and then decides to destroy humanity. Right. Or the Matrix where um, same thing happens, but decides that humanity would make good batteries. And so what's interesting is, you know, in none of those timelines do we have um, is AI developed while everybody has stories about what will happen if uh, AI is developed. And so, you know, we're uh, <laughs> maybe they change the timeline by freaking everybody out. Um, no, but, you know, we're it, it's bringing up all of this and it's like, OK, were these just stories or are these actually like legitimate things to worry about? Um, but, you know, the uh, Aquarius and future horror, like what could go wrong? Um, and it's interesting because, you know, it's uh, Aquarius like Capricorn is Saturn ruled, but in a very different way. And so there, it's a fear of order, just like with Pluto and Capricorn, it's the, you know, the, the, um, how should we say, like the cruel, like pen or cage or prison of, of order. And with uh, Capricorn, there's a lot of looking to the past, but with Pluto in Aquarius, it's imagining a new order, right? Like a ordered by inhuman intelligence and us being you know, basically stuck and, you know, either used or eliminated or, you know, um, um, yeah, whatever, um, by the, um, by this order, which might develop, right. But from an intelligence, not our own, whereas Pluto and Capricorn seem to be more, um, looking with regret and horror at, um, what we've all done to ourselves and each other. Right. But in with the world. Pluto <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. In the world with Pluto and Capricorn, Aquarius, it's like something else is going to come in and do it to us. We have that like outsider feeling. I wonder if yeah, aliens. But... I, I wonder if Pluto and Aquarius will take some of the alien stuff, um, and like ramp it up or you know fully adrenalize it. People mm -hmm. will get uh, afraid of you know that that form of other intelligence um, doing something Pluto to us, especially yeah, well, from the sky. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, and that was the interesting thing. Somebody made a comment because I made a comment in the AI episode that the the fear that people have about AI is that we'll create another sentient, um, essentially like alien um, race of people on Earth that happen to be smarter or more powerful than us. And if we, they treat us like we treat other sentient entities on Earth, then like humans might be in bad shape. Um, and I thought that somebody made a comment when I said that we'll create another one. Um, they said that there's already other sentient, you know, beings on earth, but we just often don't treat them well, or we don't treat them as if they have the same, you know, level of sentience as we do. But then, you know, what happens on the flip side, if we create something that has the same attitude or, you know, towards us in some way is the concern. Yeah, are you are either you familiar with the dark forest hypothesis? I don't think so. Okay, so uh, the dark forest, the idea is that the universe is quiet and we don't see signs of life because any civilization um, smart enough to um, be able to send signals and see what's going on in the universe um, realizes that the universe is full of other civilizations that are threatened and know that like that it's a forest at night where things are quiet because there are predators and so other civilizations are quiet because they don't want to reveal their location um and you know and get space nuked or whatever and there's some there's some really good fiction that has proceeded from that uh, like the it's three like wakanda part. almost black panther like right how they just like are hidden <laughs> yeah 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 right and uh, Right. Like, so, yeah. And if you live in the forest and there, you have any predators, you know, to, uh, you know, that concealment is probably your best defense. And so the universe is quiet because everyone knows to hide. Right. Whereas humanity is like young enough and stupid enough right now that we're just like shooting off fireworks and making loud sounds and attracting as much attention as possible to us. 
Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in the three body problem, it begins close to our timeline where, you know, we send out, you know, we send out our, our stupid messages. <laughs> we're like, we know math and we can make music. And we get one response ever, which is basically trans decodes to um, I'm a pacifist. Most of the people in my, most of my people are not, do not um, like cease broadcasting and do not respond. Do not answer me. Do not answer this. Do not answer this. Wow. Nice. Good times. <laughs> but, um. very, but like full Pluto and Aquarius feels right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm really curious to see if we're going to get some concrete alien proof during this transit. Yeah, I mean, even just, you know, we're so close, even if if biological life, because uh, there's other places in our solar system where, um, you know, the ingredients are like possible, you know, that's legitimately something that could be discovered in the next 20 years. And that would be an interesting facet of the transit as well and would be game changing scientifically and theologically and all sorts of other things if even if just microbial life was found on another planet in our solar system. Yeah, yeah, with, you know, so Aquarius in the tarot is usually synced up with the star card, right, which is, you know, this woman receiving light and inspiration from the night sky above, and then, um, you know, sort of pouring it out into a little pool uh, at her feet. Um, but, you know, if we bring Pluto into that, like the underworld is that night sky, right, like the the infernal realms, the, the, the place of... Uh, yeah, the the like source of of terror and potentially death is above rather than below. The unknown, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, all right. So I didn't mean to go on a whole other tangent about AI for like yet another month in a row, and I apologize <laughs> to all the people that are not into that. Well, we're know, talking about else. aliens, Chris. That's true. We're talking about aliens now, so that's better. That's improvement. Um. All right, let's transition into another news story. Another thing that happened, not AI related, was uh, Prince Charles became King Charles um, and had uh, his, it's not an inauguration, but he uh, was coronated on May 6, 2023. And I am not usually like a major royal watcher, but I, I was interested in this only because I'd used his chart as an example before because um, he was born with Leo rising and the sun in Scorpio in the fourth whole sign house. And um, from so much of his life, because he was born in 1948, so he, you know he's like an old man now, for so much of his life, it was spent sort of like waiting um, because his mother lived to be super, super old and was like the queen. She was the longest reigning, I think, a monarch in history or, or pretty close. And so there was a huge part of his life that was sort of like spent waiting around to see if like he would become king at some point, or even if he would die never having become king because his mother ended up like outliving him or something. And so that finally, you know, we've learned the final part of that story, which is that didn't happen. And his mother passed away last fall. And interestingly, the night right before he was coronated as king in May, there was that Scorpio lunar eclipse, and that occurred right in his fourth house. So I thought that was really interesting and really fitting just because of that fourth house placement um, and how on the one hand it was providing some culmination and some end to that story in terms of his long wait to become king and the question of whether he would become king, um, as well as you know the other things associated with that just in terms of his family and his inheritance and all those those other things surrounding it so interesting little correlation there yeah well if you pop back to the chart for a second um was that his chart you had up real quick yeah okay yeah and so this is literally his nodal return um mm -hmm. and he was born um more or less on an eclipse himself like he was born um what like a like a day and a half before um before a lunar eclipse um, and the moon is with the North node. Um, ooh, so it's real close. It would have, it's right at the edge of being a legitimate or being a visible eclipse, but like sun and moon with the nodes in Taurus and Scorpio, just like what happened a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, well, like that's, well, look, that's look. such a, that's such a, um, actually, uh, like a, uh, a, a doubling down on the natal signature. 
Well, and if you look at in the bottom right, it shows of my chart uh, layout using solar fire, it shows the preceding lunar um, phases and the two eclipses that preceded his birth were a, an eclipse in Scorpio and an eclipse in Aries. And that's literally what we just had. We just had an eclipse in Scorpio and eclipse in Aries, like right um, around the time of his, his coronation. So that's a real striking sort of natal transit correlation there. And it's just a reminder of, you know, that's one of those, those oldest principles in astrology, especially in the Mesopotamian astrological tradition that goes back to at least 2000 BCE is just major stuff happens under eclipses. And especially um, there are uh, changes of rulers of like kings and queens and, you know, kings and queens die or um, rise to power around the time of eclipses. And it's weird that even in this day in 2023, that's still happening. And we still have things like that happening in really striking ways. Yeah. It's very house of the dragon, right? Um, the, and, <clears throat> and I had a, a few other thoughts on that. Again, I'm not much of a Royal watcher, um, but that, you know, it speaks to the whatever, you know, the, the Babylonian omen watcher in me to see people taking on thrones and what are the sun and the moon doing. And so that's interesting with the, the, it being on a lunar eclipse on the South node that he, uh, in Scorpio, that, um, that he took the crown um, because, you know, with the South node, we often have absence or loss or having to let go. Um, and then, you know, there were some, there were, there were a lot of unhappy planets in water signs during that time. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting because the, the star of the show is the queen's absence, you know, mm -hmm. like her absence is probably much bigger than his presence. Um, and so it also made me one, I was thinking about like, just on, from an electional point of view. So from a transit point of view, that's triggering his sun and moon and all that, that makes sense. Um, that that would be around the time that he would um, be coronated. But then, you know, electional astrology is when do we schedule the thing that's going to happen anyway? We could pick a Tuesday or a Wednesday, right? And I was just thinking about, you know, what is what does that uh, what does that say that it was done on that um, uh, that lunar eclipse on the south node? And it seems less about in, in it seems so if if the sun is the the figurehead themselves the one wearing the crown um I'm, i was thinking about the the moon um as speaking to the dynasty itself like literally the family that has power uh in this case the windsors and i don't know i if i were tending to the windsor dynasty i would not um i would not do it on a lunar eclipse with the moon in fall with its ruler fallen that seems not great that seems to speak for a dissolution or a moving towards dissolution for for the dynasty itself um less about him and more about you know like what it says about where where that family is going hmm. yeah. yeah and you get some interesting transits this year too the Uranus coming for his son and chart ruler Let's see how that the goes chart chart back up again oh yeah so Uranus will get up to like 22 23 23 yeah yeah okay so that'll oppose his sun and you know the eclipses have been bouncing back and forth between Taurus and Scorpio for for a little while now and there were there was a set last year shortly after um Queen Elizabeth died and then there were some preceding it so it's just kind of notable how it reminds me that sometimes eclipses because they happen in the same pair of signs for like a year and a half sometimes proceed or like foreshadow events and build up to them as well as sometimes their their culmination um but yeah that's a really interesting point about the the uranus transit to his son as well yeah it'd be an interesting year <laughs> for sure this, this was the year that was probably always going to happen but kept not happening yeah it kept being put off or extended and then it finally finally came mm -hmm. um so and let's see that reminded me of um i was doing some research on the mesopotamian tradition and just like seeing that weird correlation of a king being coordinated at the time of an eclipse reminded me of in the mesopotamian tradition they had this um 
It was actually the longest running scientific program in history. And we refer to it now as the astronomical diaries where the ancient astrologers and sky watchers in Mesopotamia, starting around 750 BCE, they set up this program of going out every night and observing the stars in the sky and then writing down any um, of the alignments of what they witnessed, as well as any astrological omens or anything that was happening. And they would also sometimes write down things that were correlating on Earth at the time, like um, the prices of commodities, basically like tracking the markets to a certain extent. They would note the level of the Euphrates River, and they would also sometimes note important political events that happened at the time. And one of them that's really fascinating that they actually noted um, way back in the year in the fourth century is we have this tablet that was um, recovered that's been rediscovered. It's in the British Museum, but it's a it's a little clay tablet um, that has writing on it in the the wedge shaped language of cuneiform. And on this tablet, um, it notes an eclipse that took place recently on September twentieth, three thirty one BCE. And then one of the things that it records is um, Alexander uh, of Macedon or Alexander the Great, he's sometimes called defeating Darius, um, the prince of or the king of Persia at the time in the Battle of Gogamela on October 1st, 331 BCE. And the significance of that was basically this was Alexander the Great defeating the, the Persian king and, and essentially setting himself up as the new king across um, Mesopotamia and the Middle East at the time. Yeah, that so, was the decisive battle, right? There were a lot, there were several important battles, but that was that was the that was the decisive battle. And uh Darius, uh Darius was forced to flee and was basically in exile in his own country, being chased around um by the uh the macedonians right yeah so um and and the um tablet it records an eclipse occur occurred there's an amazing article on this there's many articles you can find but there's one on livius.org that's titled astronomical diaries where it talks about the diaries and the things that they record um but it it talks about the record that the astrologers who wrote the astrologer who wrote this tablet made it says on october the 20 on the 24th in the morning the king of the world parentheses alexander erected his standard and attacked opposite each each other they fought in a heavy defeat of the troops of the king uh in parentheses darius alexander inflicted the king darius his troops deserted him and to their cities they went they fled to the east um so and it also notes the relevant um things from the relevant omens from the compilation series the Enuma Anu and Lil at the time that was relevant to the specific eclipse that had just occurred right before that and it gave the interpretation from the Enuma Anu and Lil which said the significance it says um if either on the 13th or 14th the moon is dark the watch passes and it is dark his features are dark like lapis lazuli he's obscured until his midpoint the west quadrant as it is covered the west wind blue the sky is dark his light is covered so it's describing this specific type of eclipse and then it says if this happens the significance is the son of the king will become purified for the throne but will not take the throne an intruder will come with the princes of the West. For eight years, he will exercise kingship. He will conquer the enemy army. There will be abundance and riches on his path. He will continually pursue his enemies, and his luck will not run out. Um, so it mentions a specific period of eight years. And what's crazy about that is that after Alexander conquered uh, Mesopotamia and won this battle, he actually did reign for eight years before he eventually went over and fought in wars all the way to the westernmost portions of India and then eventually was forced to turn back. He went back to Babylon and then promptly died basically and his reign ended under mysterious circumstances eight years later. So not only did the um, canonical series make an accurate prediction about his reign ahead of time, but there were just astrologers that were there witnessing it and writing down what was happening at the time. And it just reminded me, I, went, and I wanted to mention this because 
that's part of what we're doing here. And that's part of the tradition that we're tied into when we do these forecast episodes. And we spend the first um, hour basically reflecting on recent events that we've seen and noting some of the important astrological correlations that we noticed at the time and adding that to our, our sort of repository of collected things. And then we move on to talking about the forecast that's coming up in the month ahead. It's part of building up that sort of literary tradition of empirical observations of astrological movements in the sky and what they correlate with event-wise on Earth. And that's been going on for over 4,000 years now. But in that way, doing some of these forecast episodes, these are kind of like our tablets that we're recovering or we're recording in our time period. That's um, that's some that's some beautiful Mercury Saturn conjunction stuff, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. All right. So, other news. Do you guys have any other news or events you want to mention? No. Okay. Um, so. Let's no, not see. Really. I've been um, I've been very distracted. Yeah, you've had a lot going on, uh, but are starting to come out of that period. Um, a lot of Mercury retrograde stuff. Um, oh one yeah, thing... I mean, I I have like you know the, I was telling you you both earlier. This was just this was a full on cliche Mercury retrograde. Um, in addition to the big stuff, there was lots of little stuff. There were three different instances where there was difficulty getting an important package from the post office and multiple un seemingly unnecessary steps had to be taken, you know, over and over and over again, you know, just classic stuff. Nice. Did you have any Mercury retrograde things, Kira? Yeah, I had some cute Mercury retrograde. Mercury rolls my seventh and my 10th, or sorry, my seventh and my fourth house. Um, and it's been retrograde in my, or it was retrograde in my third. And um, I just, every retrograde without fail, I'm reunited with someone from my past, um, especially the mercurials. I have a lot of, I've dated a lot of mercurials <laughs> that I'm so close with. So one funny thing that happened, well, one, I went on a date for the first time in forever and <laughs> my business partner um, has the same name as this guy that I went on a date with and they're both Virgos and it just like things like that. They both have Venus and Libra. So that's one thing that happened. And I kept accidentally like texting the other because <laughs> they have the same name. Um, and then another fun one was I was trying to book an Airbnb in Brooklyn and the ones I kept trying to request kept falling through. And it's always third time to charm with Mercury retrograde, at least in my experience. So I knew the third one was probably going to happen and it did. And um, it ended up being like directly across the street from one of my really good friends um, in Brooklyn, who is one of those Virgo stelliums <laughs> that fell, fell in my seventh house. So yeah, I just got to see a lot of my um, mercurial friends and friends in general, right into people on the street, walking around Brooklyn. Um, so yeah, I, I enjoy that part of Mercury retrograde as someone um, who has a Mercury rolled seventh house. It's always like I get to see people from my past and it's always kind of fun. Yeah, I love that backward looking notion to Mercury retrograde because usually the planets move forward in the signs of the zodiac and the degrees. But then when they start moving backwards, it's not just it's really can be a process of not just revisiting things from the past, but also like looking back and reflecting on the past in very tangible ways. But sometimes it's not until you're in the midst of that and you're experiencing that, that you, you truly understand what that means. Yeah. Yeah. It, I bet, I bet the other Jupiter world people out there have similar things with Mercury rolling the seventh and just like, oh, here's someone from, you know, I went to school with 10 years ago or whatever, someone I used to work with, like just people keep coming back. Yeah. Yeah. I had that as well with my Mercury retrograde story, which it was a retrograde through my fourth house because it was in Taurus and around the time of the, towards the end of the retrograde and around the time of the direct station, I uh, had a visit with uh, like a family visit. So there was like a fourth house thing of meeting up with my mom for the first time in a year. Uh, but also I had this sudden strong urge to um, go back and visit the city I grew up in and um, both visit my old house where I grew up, but also to sort of like drive around my old neighborhood. And it was a lot of like going back and revisiting and remembering things that I'd forgot. 
about a, what seems like a different lifetime, like 20 years ago. And there was this real looking back to the past feeling. And I didn't realize until I was almost done that like Mercury was retrograde and stationing in my fourth house. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was really striking. It's also kind of striking because I noticed, you know, it was retrograde in my fourth house, but that's also my quadrant third house. And the third house is like your neighborhood. And I could kind of see the overlap of both of those, of the fourth house significations as well as the third. And I was thinking about that a lot this month because with um, Ben Dyke's new translation of Firmicus Maternus that I was reading through, it was really evident that Firmicus is sort of wrestling with and is trying to reconcile the whole sign house placements and the degree-based house placements at the same time. And he has this desire to use both just like Rhetorius did. Um, and you can see him referring to this periodically throughout the text. Um, and I thought it was interesting having like a real embodied experience of both um, as I was doing that this month with that Mercury station in, in Taurus. Yeah, I have that too, actually, now that I think about it. Um, well, it's not the same, but Mercury ruling the fourth, I guess, Mercury, you have a Gemini IC as well then, right? Because right. um, yeah, I went back home too and went to go visit my family and my hometown and yeah, lots of that with Mercury retrograde as well. Nice. M my primary uh, my primary movement through the past was while I wasn't dealing with drama in the present, um, was going line by line through a particular section of Firmicus in preparation for a presentation at NORWAC and a couple other projects. And so, you know, whenever I could get away and concentrate, I was literally just, you know, reading a 1600 year old text and like line by line, trying to extract all of the conditions under, under which we get this delineation and thinking about that and sort of installing a Firmicus bot in my brain. And what's funny is that I, uh, I didn't plan um, to do that project once Ben's new translation had come out. That was, it's just Firmicus time, apparently. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Well, and it was Firmicus time. And then there was somebody that released a podcast independently on Firmicus Maternus on a different podcast um, that didn't know. It was like around the same time that Ben's translation came out and they didn't realize it was just independent. And it just reminded me that sometimes I think it's tied in with whatever Firmicus's birth chart is, which we don't have. It must have been getting activated recently because he was just coming up in all sorts of different ways in the same way in like February, for example, Valens was coming up a lot, um, or which was part of that was tied in with his anthology, you know, me publishing that in October, right on that eclipse in Scorpio, which was very close to his son. But sometimes people's birth charts live on for like centuries and centuries afterwards. And when their memory comes up, it's their chart like getting activated over again. Yeah, it seems like Firmicus is having having a transit, getting, you know, having something, something's popping because that's three or four things that are all Firmicus centric that aren't tied together. Like they could have happened at different times. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then one other that was actually related to that in an indirect way that I meant to mention that was really notable and kind of important in our community was um, there was an astrologer named Ellen Black who passed away on May 10th, um, not long after the Scorpio eclipse. And she was one of the founders of Project Hindsight, actually. She was Robert Schmidt's wife, and he was the principal translator. But she was the one actually in the 1980s that got into astrology first and got a consultation with an astrologer and was impre so impressed by it that she started encouraging Schmidt to look into it and to take it seriously. And I was told by a friend who knew them, Livia Schenken, in the past week, just a few days ago, that she said that one of the first things they did after she got a consultation was that she bought, they got a translation of Firmicus Maternus that existed, Bram's translation that was done in the 1970s and read it, and that Schmidt read the translation, Livia said, and said, I could do a better job of translating this. And that was somehow connected to their start and what would eventually become the start of Project Hindsight. Because by that point, they were already doing a translation project for ancient mathematical texts, which was the first version of Project Hindsight in the 1980s. But then in 1992 and 1993, they got together with Robert Hand and Robert Zoller and founded the Astrological Project to go back and translate and recover ancient astrological texts, um, which has then reshaped the astrological community over the past 30 years in many notable ways. So I just wanted to, to mention her and recognize her because that was a major notable thing that happened this month. 
All yeah, right. Very, very butterfly effect with that story, right? Like Ellen gets a reading and then, you know, oh, it's cool. And then they buy Firmicus and, you know, what a, what an, in, like, what a difficult to predict series string of events, especially without astrology. The, the little, like the one decision that then ends up, um, you know, it's very much the grain of sand that creates the avalanche 40 years later. Yeah, well, no, it's reminiscent also of what sometimes happens in eclipses, like we were talking about last month, which are, whereas sometimes you'll have an eclipse and a notable part of your chart and something important will happen, but you won't recognize its significance until later. And sometimes it's like hidden or obscured what, what the notable event was that happens. Like sometimes it's obvious and you get like mm -hmm. Charles being coronated or something like that, which is very public and very obvious, but other times similarly significant events happen in our lives that coincide with eclipses but we don't know until later until retrospect until looking back what the significance of that was yeah 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 all right so i think that was all of the major news stories that i meant to uh, mention and we're getting towards the end of our first hour here before we transition into talking about the forecast for june i did want to mention our sponsor which is the website and the astrology software program known as Archetypal Explorer at archetypalexplorer.com. So Archetypal Explorer is a web-based astrology program which is built for astrology enthusiasts. And it's really awesome because it provides astrological tools such as a horoscope chart as well as visual transit timelines and calendars that you can use to actually um, look at the transits that are coming up both in terms of your uh, personal life and in terms of world events in general. So here's a screenshot I took earlier today that I'm actually going to be using during our forecast of the time, type of transit timeline that you can get through Archetypal Ex Explorer where it shows the entire month ahead or year ahead or whatever time frame you want, and it plots the transits of the planets in a graph that goes up, uh, the closer the aspect gets to going exact, and then as the aspect recedes and moves away, the graph goes downwards so that you can really visualize um, in a more like almost like three-dimensional sense the transits and see them not just as a singular event or point that occurs on a certain date of the calendar, but instead as this process, this overlapping process of different transits sort of coming into being or coming into intensity and passing out of that. So with Archetypal Explorer, you can set it up to also give you interpretations of each of the transits from two different exclusive interpretation books, one of which was written by Richard Tarnas um, and draws on his approach to astrology uh, inspired by his book Cosmos and Psyche. And you can get interpretations of some of these transits which where it'll give you like a positive side of that or a positive interpretation of that, as well as a, a more negative or a, what the challenges are that come from that sort of transit, which is super useful if you're trying to understand what the transits mean for you that are coming up in the near future. Um, other features of the program are also a calendar, which you can use to schedule dates and use it for electional purposes for planning different things. Um, and also, um, there's a separate interpretation text uh, drawn on the book, The Archetypal Universe by Ren Butler, uh, that gives you a second set of interpretations besides Tarnas's interpretations, if you would like more. So it's a super useful program, and it's one that I use constantly and that you'll see all the time. I used it, for example, in the AI episode in order to look at some of the outer planets coming up over the next 20 years. And that's how Nick and I zeroed in on some of those time frames, like 2033 and 2040, because of the ability to see overlapping transits rather than just singular ones in isolation. Um, so that's a super useful program. It's membership based, so you can get a free seven day trial just to try it out if you'd like at archetypalexplorer.com. So I'd recommend checking it out. And um, yeah, thanks to them for sponsoring this episode. All right, so let's make a transition into talking about the month of June and talking about the astrology. So I already made, already gave sort of the overview of that. Here's the alignments calendar again that just shows some of the major ingresses and stations and lunations that we're going to be talking about. Um, but let me put up the chart for 
the first of the month so that we can kind of frame where the planets are and where they're going to be as we begin the month. So I forgot to say that today we are recording this on May 21st, uh, 2023. We started, I think, about, what, probably 1.40 p.m. in Denver, Colorado. So here's the chart for June 1st that shows some of the astrological alignments that we start the month out with. So let's see, where should we start? We see Pluto is still barely in Aquarius, but it's getting ready to retrograde back into Capricorn. We see Jupiter is now three degrees into Taurus. Um, Mercury has returned just about back to its station degree, I think. It's back to like 16 degrees of Taurus at the start of the month, which is not super far from where it went retrograde um, several weeks ago. The sun is making its way through Gemini. Mars is already seven degrees into Leo. So it's starting to finally move out of that square with Jupiter and that opposition with Pluto, which is um, so exact right now here at the end of May. And we have our first lunation of the month forming on the third, which is going to be that full moon in Sagittarius, which is the second non-eclipse lunation after we start to fully head out of the eclipse season here. So where should we start? What's catching your eye? What are the things that are standing out to you in terms of the, you two, in terms of the opening of the month? Oh, let's see. I mean, uh, so one thing worth saying is that June has a lot less change than um, April and May. Um, we've got Jupiter in a new sign by the time June begins. Um, Mars is going to be in the same sign all month. Once Venus ingresses into Leo earlier, early in the month, in Leo the whole month, Mercury <clears throat> finishes up in spends the first half of June finishing up in Taurus and then is in Gemini. And that's, there aren't any other, and then Pluto goes back to Capricorn, but, you know, it, we've had a, you know, kind of a turbulent, lots of, um, lots of big, important changes over the last few months, like April or end of, end of March, beginning of April, right. We got the, like Pluto's in a new sign for the first time in 15 years, Saturn's changing signs and then Jupiter changed signs and, oh, it's an eclipses and it's Mercury retrograde. And the, the last two months have just had a, there's been a lot going on. And it's not that nothing happens in June, um, but we don't have the same level of big pieces being rearranged. Like the pieces are, the big pieces are going to, other than Pluto going back into Capricorn, the big pieces are just where they are um, in June and they're going to be there for a while. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely the vibe that I've been feeling going into June as well. It's like we finally get some time to digest everything from the past couple months and um, move into a period of like adjustment. There's a lot of like squares happening, but um, yeah, there's no, there's not these like big changes like we've been having in, in April and May. Yeah. I'm so excited for, I, 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 that, that is literally the plan is just get to June and then <laughs> pause and for out. a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Same. Actively yeah. sedate myself. Yeah, especially for fixed signs, getting out of eclipse season and having things settle down again from the major changes and the ma the period of like things being thrown up in the air, which was both a uh, sort of side effect or direct effect of the eclipses themselves in Aries and Scorpio, but also of the Mercury retrograde conjunct Uranus and Taurus and how that was sort of like amplifying um, the sort of disrupt disruptive quality of that time. So we get a bit of a uh, break from that here this month, uh, but this month is also setting up for some other major changes that are coming this summer with the Venus retrograde in Leo, um, especially once Venus changes signs and moves into Leo, because it's going to spend so much time there over the next several months, but especially starting around by mid-month, around June 19th, Venus actually moves into its shadow phase because it's going to pass over the degree that it will later retrograde back two um, later during the course of the the retrograde period where it's when it stations direct there on September 3rd so the pre-retrograde shadow phase begins on June 19th and like I said the 
sort of precursor even to that, which is the ingress of Venus into a new sign when it moves into Leo is going to take place on the, the 5th of June. So already at that point, we start to get a shift and we start to get the build up to something in the Leo sectors of all of our charts. Yeah. And that's, you know, we have two things like early, early June, right. Which is the, 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 we get a full moon pretty early. Um, and then we get Venus's ingress into Leo just, I believe two days after that. Um, and both of those are, those are both um, events involving fire signs. There's um, you know, it's, there's so much Venus in Leo to talk about, and we will be taking four or five months <laughs> to talk about all of the mm -hmm. Venus and Leo things. But it is interesting that, you know, we get started, like, again, just before the ingress, we have a full moon in Sagittarius, which is ruled by Jupiter in a Venus ruled sign. Um, and, you know, when we were talking about this earlier, when you look at a lot of what's going on um, this month, the a lot of the planets end up answering to venus right we have um mercury still in taurus for for the first half of the month looking to venus for direction jupiter is in taurus now and will be for a year looking to venus for direction saturn is in the sign of venus's exaltation and uh looks to jupiter for direction which is in venus's sign and so there's just a lot that's kind of uh coming back to venus and what venus has planned yeah and venus is getting ready to start looking backwards into the past and bringing up things from the past um, in order to set a more solid foundation for the future and so so for some people it'll be looking back and digging up old things from the past but for others it will be that important turning point that sometimes happens with venus retrogrades of setting a new foundation for the future um yeah, it seems like some people are really tied into that Venus retrograde cycle and, and important events are pretty um, common when those take place. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so even, even though we have the ingress this month, it's going to be another six weeks until we have six or seven weeks until Venus turns retro. And so we've got like, a, a, you know, we've got an, an entry way, right? Or we, you know, we have the the road to the retro um and sometimes some uh, sometimes those are smoother than they should be and they sneak up on you but this time as soon as venus enters leo mars is right there and it looks like venus is chasing mars um and they'll get it looks like you know venus is going to overtake mars but venus keeps slowing down and slowing down and slowing down and doesn't quite make conjunction but we have the two moving increasingly as a pair all this month and for um, the first half of July. Um, and so in Venus-Mars conjunctions are, as we say, not subtle. Um, <laughs> uh, they're, uh, the polite way to put it is uh, inordinately passionate. And then we have this almost uh, Venus-Mars conjunction moving through Leo, which is, again, a sign not um not famous for its subtlety um or tact or lack of drama for the yeah. record um venus and mars finally do come together in aquarius early next year in february oh. um but yeah we we have a like a i think kind of a glaring lack of venus mars aspects this year we had our final one already we had only have three exact aspects this year and the last one was um, a sextile between Venus and Gemini and Mars and, um, or sorry, Mars and Gemini and Venus in Aries. So yeah, it's this weird tension with them, Venus kind of chasing Mars through Leo and then having to stop and go backwards and they don't get to meet up again until February. Right. So Venus stations retrograde on July 22nd. So that's when that 40 days and 40 nights of Venus retrograde begins, but by that time, Mars has always already slipped out of Leo into Virgo and sort of escaped um, the completion of that aspect or of that connection or union between the two. Um, so, you know, what does that mean? I was watching a live stream of um, Nick Dagan Best and Patrick Watson are doing live streams now pretty frequently, I think a couple times a week on Nick's YouTube channel, which you should check out and subscribe to. 
and Patrick was talking about how in in horror, um, you know, usually that's a specific type of thing when a planet is a faster planet is applying to an exact aspect with another planet, but then the the second planet escapes and moves into the next sign that it's usually indicative of something that's forming that seems like it's about to happen, but then it doesn't quite come together um, in the horary question. And we almost have like a broader, like mundane version of that here with the union of Venus and Mars seeming like it's impending, but then uh, losing that or that being aborted in some sense at the last minute. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's like the yeah, it's interesting because the the literal motion is it looks like Venus is chasing Mars and narrowing the distance, but she just gets slower and slower and slower. And you know, um, like if you looked at it at most points, but like, oh well, she's gonna catch him, right? right. Um <laughs> she, but then she runs she's, out of steam. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then eventually it's like, oh, I need to go back. Mm -hmm. uh, and then then we get a separation. And so, right. yeah, it, it's interesting to think of what is the, you know, what is the thing that looks like it's going to come to completion that doesn't, right? There's that side of it. But then there's also, it's two planets close together in the same sign, transiting the same, uh, the same house in the natal chart. There's going to be, you're going to get a lot of um, Venus, Mars, fun and drama uh, being generated through, you know, June and then into July. Um, like there's just... Um, there, there's a lot of, they still live in the same apartment, right? They're still like sharing the same bathroom. There's lots of interaction. Um, there just isn't that, that moment of union. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so that makes one, sense. one, um, you know, and so on just one level, like on a, per, on a personal level, right? This is, um, this has huge, this is hugely, I'm sorry, Venus, Mars and Leo, um leading into venus retrograde it's the potential for um dramatizing things making um relationships and you know uh, moments of relating more dramatic than maybe they need to be like a little bit more spotlit and covered in glitter and fire um like it's th there's gonna be we need to uh i think it would be wise especially if you're you know you've got fixed anything especially relational planets to just kind of watch the drama because the natural tendency um, is very dramatic. It's very bright. Like the, um, I don't know, as I've been thinking about like, what is, you know, how do we, what, what does Venus, Mars in Leo look like? Like it's very, it's very drag. It's very over the top, right? It's not just appearing, right? It's, you know, it's over the top, like pushing, um, um, pushing, how should I say, like pushing appearance to, um uh to to make as much of an impact as possible right this is the sign of the sun and the sun is all about seeing and you know what's what's uh what's visible um and if that's operating on a let's say unconscious uh or semi-conscious level like the being pushed to make to dramatize things can be a problem right <laughs> sometimes sometimes problems sometimes you have to make something a problem big to see it and address it and then sometimes that just makes it way worse um but this is just it's very dramatic um and in terms of you know uh, psychology saying like what is this you know what is uh, was this about like what kind of what kind of triggers are there going to be for these uh these episodes um <clears throat> the, the different episodes in the dramatic series um, you know, it's ego issues and like feeling seen, like I don't feel seen or you see me incorrectly, um, or, you know, um, you know, I don't feel valued, right. It's this kind of stuff, like in relationship when we're dealing with Leo, right. Cause it's about, it's about that, that seeing, um, or not being seen. Yeah. And the desire to be recognized and to be centralized or treated as central, um and the tensions that come when that's not happening yeah yeah one and we get yeah when we when we want when we need to be seen for something and we're not seen we get like angry or resentful um or you know or you know you also yeah there, there's just like all of those sort of dynamics which all of that is um I should say uh, it seems to me very present on social media um, there's a whole lot of fighting for the spotlight um, and envy over a person who's getting more and, oh, but I'm doing this and this, you know, intentional like spotlight games where, um, 
you know, where people are competing and also arranging um, the spotlight so certain things are visible. And speaking of visible, um, Venus retrogrades always deliver sexual scandal. I expect lots and lots. I, I expect a, a double dose of escandalo uh, during not just the Venus retrograde, but the the lead up as well. Um, there's <laughs> the stage is set. Yeah, I feel like especially with celebs, like all of this Leo energy is giving me like a celeb drama and scandal. Yeah. Yep. Um, in delineating Venus Mars connections, Firmicus is absolutely relentless in talking about scandal. It's just like scandal, 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 scandal. All right. You had an example or I don't know you if you were going to use that in your workshop, Austin, on planet. Okay. So we'll the, save the, that one. The particular Venus Mars combination where it will make the person um blameworthy in sexual manners uh, and their indecency will be publicly exposed. Got it. Um yeah, so that's Firmicus. And then, you know, this Venus retrograde, and since it's a retrograde, it also invokes the past and it brings up um Venus's synodic cycle where Venus goes retrograde in the same spot of the zodiac um approximately every eight years so this is going to tie us back into a retrograde and a time period in, a, in some people's lives that happened eight years ago this summer where Venus went retrograde in roughly the same uh, area of the zodiac back in the summer of 2015 um, or even eight years before that, when Venus went retrograde in roughly the same area of the zodiac in the summer of 2007. Um, so for some people, it will be either looking back to some events that happened in your life back during those two time frames or other previous time frames and eight year increments prior to that, or in some instances, bringing up and having you revisit things that were started at that time and having to return to them or having to go back and, and uh, complete something perhaps that was left unfinished. Yeah, I'm thinking a lot about this for my age group, my the people turning 32 this year, um, because a lot of my friends, a lot of people I grew up with were born under this cycle. Um, and I think, yeah, June, July, 91, we had a Venus-Mars conjunction in um, Leo. We also had Jupiter there too. Mm. It's interesting now we have the Jupiter square. Um, but yeah, just thinking a lot about being born under this the star point basically and how it should be an interesting summer <laughs> for a lot of us um, just personally even. But yeah, thinking, I think uh, actually the one in 2015, um, where was Jupiter? Wasn't Jupiter in Leo too for that one? Yeah, that was yeah. the one I always I always associate yeah. that that it was retrograde. So beautiful because we could see it. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and that was the one where in, in the United States it was really notable because the Venus Jupiter conjunction in Leo was forming, and the Supreme Court at that time ended up effectively legalizing same sex marriage. And I always remember right. it for that that we had a Venus Jupiter conjunction in the sky. And you had such an uh, amazing sort of positive like correlation happening at the same time. Um, so I'm curious what that looks like when instead this summer, it's like you have a, a Venus Mars conjunction that's forming in the sky when Venus goes retrograde. And that's a little bit more, that's much more like challenging and much more tricky um, in terms of Venus's significations compared to a Venus Jupiter uh, conjunction. Yeah. I think we had another Venus and Venus Mars conjunction two years ago in Leo as well. Um, summer of 2021. I remember that one too. So that might be a nice callback as well as thinking what happened July, 2021. Okay, let me pull the chart up for that. Yeah, there it is. I remember because I was dating someone that has the exact Venus, Jupiter, Mars <laughs> conjunction in Leo, <laughs> and I was visiting him around that time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, here is. I remember that because I remember this triple conjunction where the moon like caught up to mm -hmm. Venus and Mars at the same time. Um, and, and it was tricky because there was also the opposition from Saturn at, at 11 degrees of Aquarius. And this was like that first summer after the like 2020 COVID summer where 
it's kind of like a that was a it was really you know 2020 summer was pretty tricky and rough still but the summer of 2021 was the first one where things were a bit more open again and um yeah a lot of it was centered on on that that venus mars conjunction yeah in those uranus squares we get to have those again <laughs> yeah so let's talk about that because that's throwing in a interesting um, piece to this as well as just venus's ingress into leo at the very beginning of the month it's not a clean ingress because as soon as it moves into leo it immediately opposes pluto which is at zero degrees of aquarius and then venus moves into a square with saturn or with jupiter which it completes around june 11th um so venus is like moving into and is filling out that t-square that previously mars occupied when it moved into leo and hit uh, Jupiter and Pluto this month in in May so that's kind of a rough in ingress with the Venus Pluto opposition which can sometimes through nature of an opposition in and of itself manifest in relational dynamics and components um, but sometimes with extreme tensions of like either obsession or of issues of control or manipulation or power struggles or things like that in interpersonal dynamics. Yeah. And if, if we're also running into the nodes too, you know, that Venus, um, not just hitting that opposition with Pluto, but right after that, you know, running into the, the bendings, basically the, the squaring the nodes. Um, and yeah, just thinking a lot about this, these, these ingresses that um, these fixed ingresses, like even with the moon um, that hit the nodes and Pluto and how disorienting and kind of existential <laughs> it can, it can feel. Um, and I think with this one with Venus, it's especially, you know, people ruled by Venus, I think are really going to feel that shift and um, the kind of confusion that happens when a planet runs into the, the bendings. Right. Yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I was, yeah, confusion, I think, is a, a very good and will be a very operative word. You know, like the drama, like the potential for drama, again, really starts early. Like you don't have to wait for Venus to station retrograde um, for the drama to begin. Because Venus is just, you know, like the push pull from the nodes, right? Like in that exact square, the bendings, it's, you know, the north node says do more, the south node says let, you know, like. Or south south node says less north node says hold on tighter south node says let it go and you know in a, in a sense they're they're advocating for the opposite thing like you cannot hold tighter and let go at the same time right <laughs> you you know um you've got two hands one can be letting go and one can be holding on but to hold on with both hands you you can't let go at the same time <laughs> Um, I feel like this is like for me. I have Venus at the bendings <laughs> natally. <Okay. laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah, I can take this. Some therapy for me. <laughs> yeah, it's uh well, yeah, I don't know. I don't maybe describing it is helpful. Maybe it's just um, <laughs> the the walls of the prison. You know, I have my moon is in the degree of the bendings um and rules my ascendant. So that's eternal. <laughs> the the mm -hmm. eternal struggle is real, at least one lifetime's worth. Um, but yeah, it's like that. And then there's Pluto and oh, but the, there's Jupiter and that's nice. But I, then are we are we conjoining Mars or not? Like, you know, the the lead in to a planet's retrograde, especially Venus retrograde, it really um, you start wondering what's going on. Um, and with Venus, a lot of times it's with relationships. Um, there's like a very natural sort of accumulation of questions like, oh, I just kind of we got into this groove and this is what we're doing. But is this, do we have to do this? Do I even, do I like this? I thought, I think I like this, but maybe, maybe I'd rather do something else. Maybe there are things I don't like about this. And you get like the sort of contradictions start piling up as you get closer to the retrograde. And, you know, that I'd, I would say that's the ultimately useful and necessary parts of Venus retrogrades is really audit all of those contradictions that have built up in relationships and reassess rather than like, oh, it's the way we do things and it works, works well enough. Right. Mm -hmm. Just like Mercury needs to go back and like check work and answer old emails. Um, can't just proceed um, forward forever. Um, but with Venus, it's, you know, it's hardier. And so it's, um, you know, the, the same ambivalence and the, the back and forth that you feel about things 
Um, it's not a back and forth about information. It's about, you know, the status of relationship and how do you, how do you feel about this person and what is, how do they feel about you? And what is that? What do you call that connection? And is it the same or is it changing? And is, do I like how it's, you know, like all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so one piece of advice that I give myself and other people in a lead up to a Venus retrograde, especially one that's uh, one of those that, that hits your chart um, is the holding space for that back and forth and that ambivalence um, because the retrograde exists to take you all the way through it and out with a, a clarity on the other side, trying to get the answer six weeks early almost never works because you're not actually done with the process yet. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. and thinking about that confusion, especially with the ingress, with that Pluto opposition feels so compulsive and like... Mm. I just keep wanting to tell people like with Mars too. Mars just ran into or is there right now. Um, trying not to just be compulsive and make, you know, feeling like you have to act or make a decision right away because like, yeah, give it a couple of days basically. Yeah. Mars definitely always helps or throws in this impulsive quality. Um, and Pluto also having that compulsive or, or obsessive quality kind of magnifies that. Yeah, I like compulsive for Pluto. Yeah, it's very, I have to do this now or else the world's going to end. <laughs> no, yeah. I have to. Yeah, it's, I, have, I have some Mars-Pluto conjunction, so I am so familiar with that feeling. And I know when it's coming up, but yeah, it just gets so like, no, you don't understand the world is going to end. <laughs> I don't do this thing right now. Um, but of course it hasn't ended yet. So right. <laughs> well, that, that's only that, because you've done the thing every time. I did the thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, and sometimes with the, the Pluto, Venus Pluto alignment, the feeling is like, no, I have to do this. I have to be with this person or mm -hmm. I will literally die right yeah. now is like the internal feeling of what's leading to that compulsion, whether or not you will actually die with or without that person may, may not be the case. Mm hmm I also wanted to note, you know, we talk so much about um, relationships with Venus and it's definitely going to be relational, but there's also the creative component here. And, um, you know, I just keep thinking about this retrograde feeling so much like a creative project that people are going to be working on for like an extended period of time. And just knowing to kind of pace yourself when it comes to that. I'm, I'm currently working on an app and I know that this retrograde is going to be about that for me. Um, and so, yeah, just thinking about, you know, pacing yourself with the creative process as well. Yeah. And that if you're involved in like a creative project that, you know, extends through these months, um, you know, be ready for it to take some turns. Like right. I know, I know that I will probably be in, uh, almost certainly be in layout for the second edition of 36 faces during the Venus retrograde. And so I'm assuming layout, which is literally it's. Venus and Leo, it's the the visual, you know, it's not the words, it's how the words are put on the page in relationship to the pictures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm definitely giving that the whole Venus retrograde. Like I won't accept uh, that it's done <laughs> until the Venus retrograde is over. Um, just Sorry. let that twist and turn, right? Let it go where it needs to go. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. well, and that reminds me of our our last Venus retrograde, that Venus retrograde in Capricorn in um early early part of last year and there was the russian invasion of the ukraine and the start of that war which looked like you know it was just going to be the russians kind of steamrolling ukraine and that was their expectation evidently but then it ended up taking like much longer and becoming a much more long and drawn out conflict than they i think they anticipated or maybe than anyone anticipated uh and that was also very keyed in with a, a venus retrograde yeah this um th this mars venus um this mars venus together with venus about to station retrograde is has a weird resonance with the signature of the beginning of the war which was venus stationing direct after a retrograde with mars and um you know from what we can see from here the big uh the big ukrainian offensive is due to begin any moment 
um, which I think was probably what the Mars opposing Pluto and square Jupiter, our macho man, Randy Savage uh, signature that we talked about last month. Um, and, you know, this, this will be this, <clears throat> excuse me, this, this offensive or, you know, whatever it ends up being. Um, this is after the um, much talked about shipments of um, new, new, uh, new weapons from Western countries. Like they haven't really used those. They've been training on them, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we're going to get to see, and again, quite dramatic, right? If we're talking about drama um, with Mars involved, um, you know, we'll get to see what all that is over this Mars Venus time. Um, and I, again, I, I think it will, yes, it will probably be quite over the top in the results. It's going to not be, uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah. And as we've talked about in the past, it's like the Ukraine independence chart, the birth chart of Ukraine has Venus retrograde at mm -hmm. 28 Leo mm -hmm. and Zelensky has Saturn at 28 Leo retrograde. So there's some major events coming up that are going to be tied in with that Venus retrograde for, for both of those two charts. Yeah. It, it, it I would be very surprised if it isn't, um, uh, regarded historically in retrospect as an absolutely critical act uh, or critical moment in the war as far as deciding the outcome. Yeah, or turning point. Turning point is a really good keyword because it, it takes me back to what you were talking about earlier, the idea of reflecting is that sometimes when we reach a, cr a critical turning point in our life, you know what a turning point is, is it's like a pivot where you come up and there's like a a U-turn or there's like a roundabout in a way that you hit and that for a little while you have this this feeling of not moving forward and being slowing down and being sort of like stuck in place at a crucial moment in time but that period of slowing down and pivoting or reorienting in your life um, opens up an opportunity for reflection and for looking back into the past and deciding how you want to move forward in the future. And if you want to stay on the same trajectory, or if you want to reconfigure or change something about your current trajectory, whether it's with relationships, whether it's your professional life, it kind of depends what area of your chart Venus is going retrograde in. But that mo that, that process of hitting a pivot point or a turning point um, allows for the reflection or gives room for a period of uh, reflection. Yeah, definitely. Well, and the like the you know an actual pivot or change of direction on a deeper and more enduring level for a person like requires some going deep inside yourself, you know, to, to actually change direction, not just act different for a little bit, like a superficial sort of. Well, I'm going to do this now, but to like change your orientation, right? You know, to to switch your trajectory from southeast to north or whatever. Um, that that like requires some that kind of change requires uh, isolation and um, uh, isolation and what is the word solitude of some sort. Just like Venus will be invisibly with the sun, right? You know, part of the part of uh, the retrograde of uh, Venus is that Venus disappears from both the the western and eastern horizons for a period of time. Right. Yeah, kind of thinking about those venus ruled houses in your chart and how they're symbolically kind of going into the underworld in a way or disappearing um for this period of time in order for this shift to happen because i feel like a lot of people pay attention to the house that it's happening in but those houses that venus rules really that's what's coming up for review and revision i guess yeah that's a good point that's a really good point um all right so let's see other things happening as we said we got that full moon on the third in Sagittarius um are there any other things we want to say about that I know around the same time that Mercury conjoins Uranus on June 4th um so that's interesting because it's kind of like completing an aspect back from when Mercury stationed retrograde conjunct Uranus um weeks earlier um, and sometimes there can be like the the pace of communications can suddenly and unexpectedly quicken and things can start moving a lot faster. Um, so having that coincide with a full moon in Sagittarius in and of itself is sort of a doubling up of like a similar set of significations. That and it's like the moon 
being ruled by Jupiter on the North Node too. Um, plus, yeah, the Sun being ruled by Mercury on, with Uranus, it's like that feels so hectic and intense and we don't get any light from benefics with this moon um they're both averse to the full moon so yeah mm. i'm really like what is this moon gonna be because it just feels so um like ungrounded to me hmm. that's a really it's, good point I, I would say it wants to be grounded but can't mm -hmm. right like it's looking to jupiter in an earth sign right as the ruler of sag but like it doesn't have an angle on it. Yeah. See, yeah. I'm, and now I'm, I'm terrified that my, um, uh, that my plans to actually relax after <laughs> Norwalk, uh, are going to be, uh, are going to be ruined. Right. Cause the, the plan is to just, you know, relax and party, right. It's a Jupiter ruled full moon, Jupiter's in Taurus, but there's other stuff going on. Right. And there's specifically Mercury with Uranus, which you, also pointed out rules the sun right and so there's like surprise yeah it just feels like too much caffeine or something like that it's like too much of a dose of something you can't settle down <laughs> <laughs> yeah which, which is something both full moons and mercury conjunct uranus or hard aspects between mercury and uranus do on their own so having those coincide that's kind of a frenetic couple of days especially peaking around the third and the fourth um, and then the next day on the 5th, Venus goes into Leo and opposes Pluto, which is kind of tense as we've talked about. There is some leveling off of that or some sort of mitigation or assuaging of that when Venus then moves into the exact square with Jupiter over the next few days, um, culminating around the 10th and 11th. Um, so that's one of our more positive aspects this month is a Venus-Jupiter square with reception and that's one of the things Jupiter being in Taurus that's going to help take some of the edge off of the Venus retrograde and that even if there's major um, issues that Venus brings up during the course of the retrograde and its co-presence or conjunction with Mars there's some counterbalancing like positive influence that's offsetting things in notable ways with Jupiter in that superior position in Taurus yeah and to add to that um you know, with Jupiter in Taurus, right? It's Jupiter in a Venus ruled sign. And so, you know, Jupiter, uh, Jupiter is describing for us sort of what we can learn from. Jupiter makes whatever it touches potentially educational uh, or um, helps, you know, helps expose um, how something could, or helps reveal how something could be improved or bettered. Um, you know, Jupiter confirms, but then wants to make things better, right? Jupiter's like, what you're doing is great. Um, how about also this? Like, that would be a way to accomplish what you're doing more effectively or with less um, collateral damage or whatever. And so Jupiter sort of, um, uh, Jupiter teaching lessons from a Venus ruled place or offering, like offering to make Venus things um more about self-improvement or bettering relationships or you know etc cetera, etc cetera. like Kira you were saying with Venus retrogrades don't just look at the place Venus is stationing retrograde look at the houses um that are Venus ruled in your nativity with like the the parts of your life that al already run on Venus and so Jupiter's in one of them like ready to help figure out how this can work better um and so I think that's that's a nice thing and this is just part one we have three of these right so over the next couple months um so of yeah the exact aspects with venus and jupiter you mean yeah exactly got it um yeah and it's interesting thinking also about mitigations it's something that in rereading or reading ben's translation of firmicus and reading firmicus again for the first time in several years the entire thing he's just constantly talking about mitigations and he'll give Here's like a really difficult combination and difficult aspect, but then he'll say, however, if this placement is there, uh, adding in a positive thing, then it will offset it. So you start to think about scenarios of, you know, if something bad or negative or subjectively difficult happens, um, but then if you're able to find some sort of outside help that comes in and is able to make things better, it's like if you get sick, but then you're able to go to a doctor and the doctor tells you what's wrong and gives you some medicine and is able to like heal you from being sick. That's like a mitigation. Um, yeah. That, so um, some of the, we're doing a, 
a chapter in my year three program where we're where everyone's reading some Firmicus. And one of the students said that um, their their partner had a configuration, a pretty complicated configuration that um, basically said uh, that that um, proposed life threatening illness of a very specific nature and that the person would die from it without an aspect from Jupiter. Um, and their partner had exactly that illness and uh, almost died, but a doctor came in um, and was able to ferry them through it. And then there was a trine from Jupiter too. It was an eighth house configuration. Mm-hmm. And that's, that is one of the things I love about Firmicus is you get, a, you know, a, a very hyperbolically good or bad result. Um, but then, you know, if, uh, if blank aspects, then forget about it. Right. And sometimes sometimes it just mellows it and sometimes it cancels it. But you have both like mitigating and canceling uh, conditions for both really good combinations and really bad combinations. Yeah. And that then also ties back into what you mentioned, Kira, which is that there's going to be uh, two more exact Jupiter aspects you know, months later or weeks later, once Venus goes retrograde, where Venus is going to return back to that configuration of Jupiter. And that may be the period in which Venus is able to go back and find some of the mitigating things that help to re- resolve the situation in, especially, for example, in people's Leo houses, or perhaps in the houses that Venus rules, um, and find the resolution which offsets or mitigates the dust that was kicked up by Mars transiting through Leo in the first place. So it feels then like a lot, a large part of June is Mars sort of creating some of the problems in that area of the life, the strife or the difficulties or the conflict, the separations. Um, but then Venus having to go through that period of 40 days and 40 nights of retrograding back in order to find some of the solutions in order to mend and um, reconcile some of the problems that Mars created. Yeah, you know, the exactly. more the more we, yeah, the more we look at this, the more there might be a little bit more bark than bite because the actual retrograde portion, you know, is very configured to Jupiter, right? V- Venus will be moving backwards towards Jupiter for a lot of that and Mars will be, you know, uh, off somewhere else doing stuff, doing Mars stuff in Virgo. Um, but you know, looking like getting towards the uh, the direct station, um, you know, it's at 12, Jupiter's at 15. Um, and so it's Venus is coming off of another aspect to the, the, the second exact aspect to Jupiter and then turning around right back into another exact aspect with Jupiter. Um, and we do have, by September, we do have Mars in a Venus ruled sign, but in a sense of Venus. Anyway, um, it's interesting that, uh, again, there might be, this one might be front loaded where the actual retrograde isn't as hard as the road into the retrograde. Yeah. We even have like this kind of getting ahead, but Mercury is going to eventually retrograde in Virgo and we'll be trining Jupiter three times throughout that um, August, Mm -hmm. uh, September period. So it feels like Jupiter is really holding it down for both retrogrades and feels really like solutions support oriented um, for the summer before Jupiter then goes retrograde and kind of takes a break. Yeah, the only thing that's kind of a wild card factor when Venus is stationing though, and that throws a little bit of an unexpected wrench into things is just when Venus stations retrograde at 28 Leo, it's also kind of closely squaring Uranus, which has already made it all the way up to 22 degrees of Taurus at this point, and is like 30 30 days from stationing. So it's like we have tied in with this entire Venus retrograde Um, which we didn't have during the last Venus retrograde in Leo, is we have this square with Uranus, which at the very least is introducing some sort of unexpected or disruptive component. It may just be that it requires unique or like novel solutions in order to fix some of the things that came up that, that are the problems that arose under the Venus retrograde. But some of the twists and turns of that are going to be, I think, some unexpected in terms of that writing that script and the um the surprises that come up in the process yeah 100 the um uh yeah i'm uh, I, I think you uh if we're expecting an unusual or i should we say expecting a calmer retrograde than ex- than expected um that that 
the smoothing that Jupiter can do um, in aspect with Venus, that comes after the <laughs> the square to Uranus, right? Mm -hmm. uh, definitely got to get through that first portion because that is on a very simple level, Uranus is destabilizing, and you know, uh, harm the the many uh, the many things that Venus looks after. Many of them depend on harmony and you know relational harmony and stability and the retrogradation is already sort of unpicking that and uranus in a venus ruled sign is going to further push that yeah, yeah. thinking about like the past couple of venus retrogrades and the kind of major signatures of them we had um you know the last one with pluto station to conjunct pluto so that one had a really plutonian signature the one before that we it stationed tri or square neptune so that one had a really neptunian signature and i think the one before that was scorpio which would have had the uranus opposition i think um so i don't know i've just been thinking about how the outers have been really influencing a lot of the past um venus retrogrades and how this one has that uranus flavor um which i think i'll, I'll prefer over pluto the last one was really rough so we'll see yeah for sure yeah I, I know i will prefer it that was uh like on my descendant with pluto that was yeah fun. it was intense yeah yeah <laughs> but yeah jupiter kind of is around this time to help a bit so yeah yeah i'll take it yeah so people should pay attention to that first jupiter aspect happening there around the 11th and the 12th we can see there on the transit timeline and that's one of the more positive aspects this month uh, there are other positive aspects coming later. Um, one of the things that happens around that time that's important is that Pluto is going to retrograde out of Aquarius and it's going to move back into Capricorn and bring us back into that transit and bring something back from that time period um, that we've experienced so much of over the past decades since Pluto has been transiting through Capricorn ever since 2008. Um, so there's some unfinished business in that sign um that sort of comes sharply back into focus there uh this month starting on the 11th of June yeah back to um you know back to money and power and the architecture of thrones and the weight of history and all you know all the all the Pluto and Cap stuff yeah well and, and some of that arose with like a banking the banking crisis that happened around the time that Pluto ingressed into Capricorn in 2008, um, you know, the creation of Bitcoin, as we've talked about before, and that going from humble origins to something that's actually like impacting world events. Um, and then, of course, now in the US, at least, we have all these things about the debt ceiling crisis and whether that's going to turn into a big thing or, or disrupt things or not. And that's, yeah, something that may be relevant there with Pluto retrograding back into Capricorn sure yeah <clears throat> excuse me yeah yeah so on the more positive side of things one of the best um transits that i really like this month and is definitely good for electional purposes is um that happens actually around the same time is that mercury uh departs from taurus and moves into its home sign of gemini and mm -hmm. we get this nice transit of mercury and gemini for uh, a good chunk of june um which I really like. And although it has to pass through a sort of difficult square with Saturn at a certain point, one of its first aspects is a nice sextile with Jupiter and, or sorry, in aversion to Jupiter, but it has to pass through the square with Saturn around the 15th and 16th. But otherwise, um, it's a pretty nice transit of that planet through its home sign. Um, and some of the things that are sort of characteristic of Mercury and Gemini, which is um, an increase in like communication, um, socialness, intellectual activities like writing, poetry, speaking, and different things that come more naturally to Mercury when it's in its home home sign. Yeah, and it it speeds things up usually. Um, right. There's just like less resistance. Like things can just move quicker. Um, every every year when Venus moves or Mercury moves through Gemini, I generally just see things speed up. Like the um the you know exchanges of information the conversations the movement of objects like things just speed up and um it's also tends to you know mercury and gemini is very playful 
right? Clever mm. and playful and, you know, um, witty repartee. Um, but that's going to be kind of restrained until it gets past that square with Saturn. And yeah, well, and it's the, it hits a nice sextile. And I meant to say not with Jupiter, with Venus, like right after that, when it gets to 10 Gemini, it sextiles Venus at 10 Leo. But it's weird that Saturn's stationing right at the same time, just after that square between Mercury and Saturn completes. So this is in the same way that we just had the very first station of Pluto in Aquarius of many during that long transit that's going to happen of Pluto in Aquarius. This month, right in the middle of June, we're having our very first station of Saturn in Pisces of a long you know, two plus year transit of, of Saturn going through that sign and stationing many times. Um, so we have an intensification of that Saturn transit, and especially for people that have placements in the immutable signs around um, seven degrees, we're going to see that as an intensification of that transit. Yeah, and it's worth noting, this is as far into Pisces as Saturn's going to get this year, mm. right? And so, you know, if you have planets that were feeling, let's say, at like 10 or 11 of a mutable sign that felt, oh, Saturn's coming, Saturn's coming, Saturn's coming, Saturn's like, you know, that tide's going to go out. It's going to go back to the very beginning of Pisces. And then, you know, if you're lucky enough like me to have a planet at four Pisces, then um, <laughs> then that transit, which started to maybe it was over, then Saturn's coming back. Right. And Saturn is that, I don't know, Saturn, but it's, it's that, that heavy flow, right. Ocean of ocean of lead, right. It's liquid, but so, so heavy and quite likely toxic. Yes. Yeah, early, as early Pisces risings have definitely been feeling it. I know Mo's in the audience. We have almost, I think the same ascendant um, degree and yeah, very much feeling the heaviness of Saturn in the first um, not as bad as my Saturn return in the 12th, but definitely, definitely feeling it. Um, and yeah, just wanted to like, again, pick piggyback off of the Mercury and Gemini piece. Um, Mercury is also like visible and fast right now too. So you we were talking about how Mercury and Gemini things go fast. It, it's like even more speedy right now um as it's heading towards that direct kazimi at the end of the month so i'm just excited about the gemini house and our charts and finally getting a little bit of um yeah movement and traction especially after that that saturn square which feels like a tough decision like a tough choice to make or something or, um regarding mercury yeah well it's really so you know uh so mercury and saturn right don't agree on speed right one is the like most spry, agile, quick member of the solar system. The other is the one that is not only slow, but insists on slowness. Um, we famously had that, like, what was a square between them during the last presidential election when um, it occurred and then the votes were being like recounted and there was that delay and that slowness in counting up the votes and until eventually the outcome of the election was was known. Yeah, yeah great example and and then just looking at signs like um pisces is you know pisces is the place where mercury is in its fall and you know one way of thinking about that is that pisces things are they're not problems that you can solve quickly and with mercury right it's just like you know it, it's uh you have to go uh you have to go to the bottom of the mariana trench right it's just not something you can skate by and like quick answers and clever answers don't don't help at all. Um, and so, you know, sometimes when you have a Saturn Mercury configuration, Mercury can help figure out a Saturn problem. Um, but, you know, it's a square, which is not the friendliest of aspects and the signs. Mercury is trying to do classic Mercury and Gemini and Saturn and Pi Saturn's so interested in, you know, um, uh, how should I say, um, um, uh, tedious emotional depth <laughs> or like really deep issues or like, I don't know, it just feels life just feels this way, or there's nothing to be done. Like the, um, you know, I don't know. I, I don't want to get too morbid. Um, but it, it feels like there's just Mercury's can it, one reaction might be just trying to skate around the big heavy thing. Cause there's nothing to be done about it. If you're more on the Mercury side, or you know, being a, being annoyed by the light conversation. If you're on the 
the, the Saturn and Pisces side, but it feels like it's going to be very hard for them to interact in a synergistic way. Yeah. It's almost like Mercury's like, here's all of this information. Like I see you have a problem. Here's all the facts and the information for you to solve it. And Saturn's like, that's not going to do it. That's not going to work. <laughs> like we need some, we need some deep healing here. And Mercury's like, yeah, but here's a book you can read. Yeah. Right. <laughs> here's right. a, yeah. Um, here's a, here's a Twitter account you can follow that, yeah. uh, that tweets about deep healing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, whereas Saturn, since this is the first station in Pisces probably says like, this is going to take a lot longer to work on than, than that. Um, mm -hmm. and that, that may be just the start of a long-term process of working on something over the course of the next few years. All right. Yeah. So that's. Uh, you know, kind of a slow aspect that's happening there around the 15th. But then right after that, by the 17th, Mercury forms that sextile with Venus, which is nice. Um, and some of that slowness and that dullness of the Mercury-Saturn aspect of previous days um, is kind of assuaged and um, moves into the past. Around that time, we actually get one of the more positive aspects of this month. And even though it's somewhat subtle and like low key, I kind of like it. It's a Jupiter Saturn sextile that goes exact around the 19th. Um, but it's one of the, while more understated, one of the more stabilizing aspects that's happening mm -hmm. this month um, in the sky. And it's one of the major outer planet configurations that's occurring. So I wanted to mention it um, partially because there's also reception. It's like, Saturn is stationing in Pisces. Jupiter comes up and it's stationing at seven degrees of Pisces. Jupiter comes up and sextiles it at seven degrees and there's that reception between them. So it's like whatever the problems, again, that Saturn is bringing up for people, and these are somewhat new problems that it's bringing up, or at least that Saturn is like forcing us to start focusing on more in the long term through challenges or surmountable difficulties that arise in that part of our life or that part of our chart, there's this offsetting um, positive influence from Jupiter there at seven degrees of Taurus that's giving us an option for how to resolve those things and how to move past some of the difficulties and make them surmountable rather than just um, you know a stop sign or rather than just a brick wall that you can't proceed uh, through. But perhaps me giving us an option to find the way around those obstacles and difficulties. Yeah, or a way to sort of settle into the years of work that they require. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the first time Jupiter and Saturn see each other since the conjunction um, when they both ingressed Aquarius back in December 2020. So I'm like, I'm excited about it, this opening sextile. Um, cause that was such a powerful, like seed moment. I think that, that Jupiter Saturn conjunction, um, that it's kind of cool that they, that they're able to see each other again. And it's like, I don't know, there's just further developments, I guess, from that, from that era. That's a, that's a great point. This is the exact, this is the very first exact aspect, um, that that new 20 year cycle of Jupiter and Saturn inaugurated back in mm -hmm. 2020 in late 2020, this is the first like opening new chapter in whatever that story was that started at that time, especially in terms of world events that'll be playing out over a 20 year period until the next conjunction of um, Jupiter and Saturn around 2040. Um, but this is a important turning point for that story. Yeah, I really like that. I, I like that perspective a lot. I think that this is the the first uh, entering the first notable phase since then, um, and and that there and it's a uh, it's a soft aspect. It's a sextile, right? So there's you know there's a like it seems doable, right? To relate the the good to the bad, to the to relate to look at to look at the feel or to see the opportunities and the obstacles as belonging to one landscape. Um, rather than, you know, uh, 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 rather than experiencing them as like disconnected. Um, but, you know, when you look at a map and you could say, oh, there are 
you know, there are monsters here and there's treasure here. And if I go through the monsters, I get the treasure, then the the good and the bad get connected in a way. You're like, oh, I, I can do that. Or I want to do that. Or I don't want either of those. <laughs> I'm just going to take the scenic route. Um, but yes, yeah, stabilizing is such a, it, it's stable and stabilizing, not, not necessarily in a static way, but if you think of like stabilizing a, a like the course, uh, stabilizing a trajectory, like, oh no, we're definitely going in this direction and we know how to go in this direction. We're definitely heading east or we're definitely crossing the mountains. Um, and rather than like, oh, where do we go? Should we go there? Should we go here? You know, like that sort of, um, you know, directional confusion. This this feels very yeah stabilizing in lots of senses or in the way that a, a plane needs to be, needs to have its course stabilized, right? It can't be you know, wiggling in the sky. Yeah, that's that's perfect because that's just the keyword I was thinking of was balance. Um, there's a nice with that sextile balance between the sort of pessimism or pragmatism of Saturn and the optimism of Jupiter, and having those two qualities because either of those, if they get too, you know, far out of balance or out of whack, if you go too far in the pessimistic realm of Saturn, then like you'll never do anything because you'll always be afraid of the consequences or of making a mistake or not doing not making it perfect. Whereas if you go too far in the optimistic realm of Jupiter, you'll sort of like overshoot your mark and not be grounded enough to actually execute things in a way that's effective. Um, but here with the sextile between those two planets, we get a nice balance of those two qualities, which should be really helpful and useful for people um, around those times, especially in starting different things uh, around that time in June. Yeah. Um, one further thing I like about it is I like Saturn having uh, its ruler in a fixed sign um, because Saturn in Pisces is so sort of, as we say, prone to shape shifting and sliding in this direction or another having a really having having the ruler jupiter in this case in a really stable place i think um keeps us from some of the the excesses of um saturn and pisces's mutability where it's like you know i don't even know what the difficulty is or i don't know what the what's expected of me it keeps sliding right um that that stability stability with saturn makes it easier to um, I, it makes it easier, for example, to um, eat well if you have a diet planned out. You're like, okay, I know. I mean, these are the parameters I'm, I'm going to eat under, and so I know how to do this. I'm, not, I'm just going to do that. Versus, like, I don't know. I should eat better, but I don't have a plan, right? I have, I have no fixed course. I'm glad you said food, like eating, brought us to food because it does. This sextile feels so much more notably like material and physical than, you know, the conjunction in Aquarius. Um, so yeah, again, it just feels like, you know, fertile and like we're able to sort of put things into place for the long term um, that feel just, yeah, more tangible and less just like ideas. Yeah. yeah totally. So my, uh, our electional chart for this month actually really um, takes that into account so that you can sort of capture the energy of that sextile. So I wanted to mention that election here really quick. So this is the most auspicious date uh, in June that Lisa Scheim and I were able to find in our Auspicious Elections podcast this month, which is available on Patreon. And I wanted to show this chart. Um, so the chart is set for June 18th, 2023 starting around 11.56 a.m., 11.56 in the morning, roughly just before noon, and you end up with a chart with Virgo rising, and the ruler of the Ascendant is Mercury up at 12 degrees of Gemini. So Mercury has cleared that square with Saturn that we were talking about earlier, and it still has, uh, it was just coming off of that sextile with Venus at 11 degrees of Leo. So this is a great chart for career matters, um, the public being in the public and public reputation because Mercury is in the 10th whole sign house. It's in its own domicile or in its own sign in Gemini. Um, and it's generally just in, in really good shape. So it's a pretty strong chart for career matters and other types of 10th house activities involving additionally mercurial things like communication, speaking, 
um, social things to a certain extent, um, anything that requires quick but effective bursts of communication and of uh, transferring things, essentially. So other features of this chart are that the moon is in Cancer in the 11th whole sign house, the place of friends and alliances and groups. So it's also a very good chart for friends and groups and social movements and doing things that involve friends. The moon is in early Cancer and it's applying to a sextile with Jupiter and Taurus. Jupiter is in the ninth house of religion, philosophy, education, foreign travel, and is very well placed. And it's forming, it's still applying to that exact balancing sextile with Saturn, which is over at seven degrees of Pisces in the seventh whole sign of house, although it's in a day chart. So it's heavily mitigated, not just by sect, but also by that sextile with Jupiter. So um, that creates a good chart also for ninth house matters. And um, yeah, generally it's kind of rare that you find a chart in which both the ruler of the ascendant and the moon are in such good shapes. And so this is our, our primary election of the month that we wanted to recommend for um, starting major uh, business ventures or other undertakings in which you want an auspicious date to start things under. This is our, our favorite chart of the month. Um, what, what kind of things would you two use like a, a Mercury election for where Mercury's in Gemini? Like a launch where you have to um, send out emails, communications, you know, social media posts, especially with the sun up there too in the 10th. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, any sort of launch would, I think this would be great for. I, I love that moon Jupiter sextile. That's really sweet. Yeah, it's really um, soft and really balanced and in a positive way that I really liked. So that is our primary electional chart for the month. Um, we found, I think, at least six or seven other electional charts um, during the course of June that we just released on our Auspicious Elections podcast, um, which is available. You can find out more information about it at the astrologypodcast.com slash elections. It's one of the sort of bonus things that you get when you sign up for our Patreon at a certain level is access to that 45-minute podcast each month where we pick out at least four lucky electional charts for starting different types of ventures and undertakings. And since we're also halfway through the year, we recently discounted our year ahead electional report, where we go through and we pick out the single best electional chart for each of the 12 months of the year. And since we're halfway through the year, we just discounted that at 50% off. So you can get a hold of that at the astrologypodcast.com slash 2023 report. All right. So let's move back into the alignments and sort of talk about the la last later parts of the month. We've talked about Saturn stationing in Pisces. Um, the later things that we need to talk about in order to sort of bring a close to June is that second lunation that occurs um, on the 18th of June, I think, in the sign of Gemini um, is probably one of the last major things that we need to mention here, right? Mm -hmm. All right, let me put that up on the screen. So that occurs just before our electional chart. And we can see that the moon will conjoin the sun at, at 26 degrees of Gemini. Um, and this lunation is a little bit tricky because it's very closely squared Neptune, which is at 27 degrees of Pisces. And Neptune, of course, is going to station there only 12 days later at 27 degrees of Pisces. So for some reason, by this time around the middle of the month, and, and especially towards the end of the month, when Neptune stations on the very last day of June, we get this kind of intensification of some of that Neptunian energy. Yeah, it's also, I mean, it's intensely mercurial, right? We have uh, Mercury in Gemini, and visible, um, you know, uh, fueling the conjunction of the sun and the moon there. And it uh, it also happens with Mercury still in a, a to the degree sextile with Venus. So it's like there's that playful, fun, inventive, artsy uh, energy that the Mercury Venus sextile brings is fueling the lunation. Um, but then with that square with Neptune, there is, um, you know, there, there is either, you know, there is like a, a strong like pull towards escapism um, you know, to like just 
you know, check out um, and uh, or, you know, it could be that 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 escapism, if it overlaps with reality, can be delusional, <laughs> right? Well, if it's kept separate from uh, from the rest of life, then it's then it's a you know an escape. But there's definitely a a sort of pull towards the imaginal. Um, mm. But it you know like the 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 bones of it, like the actual conjunction and its ruler, are you know just super. It's it's Gemini juice, right? But with just like this, you know, this strong sort of um, siren song from Neptune and Pisces. Yeah, it feels like a super, super creative um, new moon. It, it feels just like for the artists out there, for the people who are, you know, creating worlds and writers, you know, writing fiction, all the fantasy. It just feels like this is such a good moon to you know, to write, to create under. Um, yeah, maybe not the best if you're having to like write a research paper or paper <laughs> for something very fact oriented and fact based, but um it feels like it can just be really great for artists and musicians and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe for people to get in touch with their creative, the 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 use of creativity as an outlet um sometimes can be really helpful. And something maybe if people aren't in touch with that, that this lunation would be very useful for um, just to take advantage of it. Yeah, kind of getting out of the writer's block that the that the um, square to Saturn might have created. Right. Yeah, I, I think it'll also be pretty. I think it works socially too. Like it's fun. You know, a little little Neptune is 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 not a problem when you're just hanging out with people. You know, you make stuff up to entertain each other telling stories yeah. imagining just don't things. drink too much <laughs> yeah or you know do that and just be aware you know there are consequences the next day but they're rarely lethal right yeah that's a good that's a good point though in terms of the um the nature of myth and like storytelling as an important part of, part of culture uh, but also an important part of just the human experience um, tapping into and the enjoyment of that, like you said, Austin, the imaginal realm as a realm of not just creativity, but also escape, but sometimes escape being necessary in order to recharge sort of internally from the world, like whatever your escape is, um, you know, better if it's sort of like a constructive version or at least like a non-harmful version of that. But there's many different ways that we all escape from the world in a way that's um, healing or that recharges us and, and prepares us for then going out and, and doing things that we have to do in mundane reality in a way that's more effective. Yeah, it's nicely put, Chris. Yeah. Um, there's also like with stories, like sometimes that like going into stories that you know are not literally true, but is part of, uh, you know, us evaluating what kind of story am I in? And it's like, and also what kind of story am I in, in this part of my life? Um, Cause sometimes, you know, we, we talk about someone's lost the plot, right. And there are also points where we feel like we found the plot, like, oh, this is what this part of my life is about. I can play my role well, now that I know what that, like what I was cast as, right. Uh, I thought I was this, but this is actually this kind of story. So I need to, you know, um, and and I don't hate it. I was just thought I was in a different story, and so <laughs> I wasn't doing a very good job. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, self narratives and the reflection on what is our narrative and what is our story. It makes me think of like the hero's journey and how you have that historically that notion of like this narrative um, that shows up in different cultures about the hero's journey and and the necessary steps that take place during the course of that and how it shows up, but also how each of us internally has our own narrative about our life stories and how sometimes the need to um, embellish on that sometimes is a natural tendency, but but sometimes during the process of periods of self-reflection, like especially a Venus retrograde, when you're looking back in relationships or like we've just had a Mercury retrograde, you sometimes rethink your own life narrative and what are the stories that we tell ourselves about that and whether it's like a you know accurate story or whether it's not an accurate depiction of like what the reality of things is yeah this and the nation makes me think of that yeah and, and yeah and i think sometimes 
you know, you are some, you really are one character for a decade or more. And then you don't realize it when life has changed and that actually you're in a different role now, right? Like, no, you're not the, um, you know, the, the brooding, uh, the, the dark brooding loner. You're actually, um, you know, uh, you're a member of the community now, or, you know, you're an upstanding member of the community and now you're the, um, the outcast and pariah. And how do you play that role? You know, or, you know, things change. And I, I gave dramatic examples, but, you know, sometimes, sometimes those roles shift and it, it takes us a while to catch up with where we actually are, right? Because we kind of, um, you know, stories uh, stories kind of keep repeating until we actually take the time to rewrite them and check them against what's happening. Yeah, when we all have, to some extent, a power to write our own life story and our own narratives and to shape those to a certain extent, Um to the, to the extent that we can. And sometimes the active shaping of those life narratives is actually really important in order to set like an end point of like, where do you want your story to go over the next year or 10 years or 20 years or what have you? Like what narrative do you want to have and where do you want to play? What role do you want to play in that narrative? Are you going to play the narrative of like the hero or the villain or something in between? So I think that's relevant for this lunation so that of what we're talking about because literally the day after this um, lunation, Venus is going to hit 12 degrees of Leo, and that is the degree that it's going to retrograde back to at the end of the Venus retrograde. So somehow this lunation is setting the starting point for a lot of that um, and some of the themes that we're going to return back to in a few months when v Venus basically retrogrades back to and returns back to this degree right around where we had this lunation in Gemini. Mm, that's really interesting. Yeah, you know, I think I, I think part of the reason um, we, we kind of went into like narrative, character, storytelling, these are all the elements of drama. Right. right. And this is, oh, we've got all this like solar stuff, right? Like the, the ruler of the lunation is in a perfect sextile with Venus um, that is going to be the point of the direct uh, station months later. Like the, you know, Leo, when we talk about dramatic, uh, it's often in a negative connotation, but this is also like Leo thinking of, thinking of, of thinking of things in terms of a play and characters and roles um, that are performed. Right. Right. Yeah. And the, and the like sort of like dramatic component to that, but also like the drama of everyone's individual life, especially from your own first person perspective, like every, all the positive and negative experiences that we're all having, because we're all the like main person in our own life story, um, how those things play out in a sort of dramatic sense is the narrative of our lives. Yeah. All right. Well, um, that kind of brings us to the end of the month and to the close of the month where we just have that Neptune station, like we mentioned, um, Venus squares Uranus, although that really leads us over into the 1st of July. And um, we get Mercury conjoining the sun at the halfway point through that cycle and the start of a new synodic cycle of Mercury and the sun. Yeah, and so right after a few days after that that new moon in Gemini, the sun goes into Cancer, and then Mercury follows the sun into Cancer, and we have, you know, with that that shift from Gemini into Cancer, um, you know, there's a lot of going everywhere and doing everything and thinking everything and saying everything in Gemini, and there's a more there's a movement toward there's a as we say the the, the movement of planets into Cancer takes them into a more um a uh, quiet more internal more felt more sort of intimate place um and with mercury moving swiftly to reunite with the sun and cancer you know it's not just the the central spotlight of things that's moving into that um you know into that more lunar landscape but uh, also the thoughts right like mercury goes from thinking everything going everywhere to you know um yeah, to like really settling on, you know, deeply felt truths and, you know, what's really important to me and who's really important to me, things like that. For sure. 
Um, and around that time, just before Mercury does that, when it goes into Cancer, um, Mars does square Uranus from 21 Leo to 21 mm. Taurus. And I think that's it's actually one of the tensest aspects this month and one of the most explosive ones besides the Venus-Pluto opposition earlier in the month. It's one of the ones that I um, think has some of the greatest potential for um, some unexpected challenges to arise and for if Mars is going to kick up dust that Venus then has to go in and clean up afterwards. This is one of those key turning points where Mars is kind of kick kicking up some dust here around the 25th, 26th, and 27th of June. Um, yeah, and and yeah, it's almost like there are two completely different stories running there, right? Mm -hmm. There's Mars, Uranus, and then there's, you know, Sun and Sun and Mercury. Like one, right. like the Sun Mercury is so quiet, intimate, like seeking reflection, and then Mars Uranus is loud and jarring. Yeah, loud and jarring is a good keyword for Mars Uranus square. Um, what are some other good keywords? Like unexpected fights, unexpected um, difficulties, unexpected separations is is probably a good keyword for Mars square Uranus. Yeah, and Mars Mars square or Mars Uranus Uranus will also that will also uh, swiftly it'll it'll give you that escalated quickly moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. my mom has that. I'm like, that sounds exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like whoa why did you get so mad all of a sudden <laughs> yeah the yeah. united states has that right mm -hmm. right yeah the, the mars conjunct mars uranus conjunction in the seventh house and some of the sometimes we've talked about in the past of being associated with some of like the gun stuff with the united states and and yeah um some of that stuff coming up in the news so being quick to anger, quick to resort to like violence or something, I guess, is one of the things that that could be uh, indicative of, like symbolically in a way. Yeah, I mean, we've used a lot of um, sort of powder keg imagery with Mars Uranus in the past, right. where it's like, who left, you know, who is, uh, it's, you know, it's the who is who was smoking around in the ammo depot again, um, where, right. it, and, you know, like with Mars Uranus, like, it's that touch point of like it ignites in a second right the gunpowder is either on fire or not it is uh it is not half on fire hmm. right it's not it's not a coal in a in a barbecue like burning hotter or not not or or a little dimmer right it's either like uranus gives a very on off uh quality to mars's heating right and also like a technological component where Mars, you know, in ancient astrology, they would just talk about like Mars and like swords or knives and cutting and things like that. But when Uranus unites with Mars, it sometimes brings this technological component to things of, you know, what is a sword, you know, digitally in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. No, I insist. <laughs> I was just I was just gonna call back to last last summer's really annoying Mars Uranus conjunction on the North Node um August 1st. And yeah, this is that opening square of that. And yeah, just a call back to that. Wasn't there something that happened? What was the news thing that happened around that time? So that was 2022, August. I'm trying to remember because I think something um notable was happening back then we had a lot there i was i remember just like airplane drama <laughs> personally i just remember there was a lot of like airline stuff happening around that time right oh yeah and, and it was the north node conjunction at the same time yeah it sucked squaring saturn just ugh yeah bad times so we have that square and that's one of the last major aspects of the month so it's a good time just to like pace yourself and if you get into some sort of conflict don't um you know dive into something because sometimes like you were saying austin things can go quicker or get out of hand quicker than you expect yeah and so just to bring uh the the you know technological quality of uranus back to that 
you if you are just walking around outside in nature there are not very many flammable substances right like i mean it, uh, like well i mean leaves you know, i was just saying like leaves trees etc there are lots of flammable substances but they don't go up in a flash um for volatile substances like gasoline um uh, gasoline or gunpowder etc cetera, etc cetera, those require like intelligent manufacture and alchemical refinement to become that volatile um you know the, there's very little in the natural world that's a, that's that volatile but we keep making um you know inventing more and more volatile substances <laughs> right um every uranus and gemini and aquarius apparently the last thing I just want to say, just because we've just been having so much Mars problems <laughs> over the past year, honestly, and um, just thinking about those Mars ruled houses and how now that we're finally out of fall and, you know, Mars is in Leo, I, I there might be a tendency to, you know, think that our Mars problems are, you know, done and over with. Um, and not that they aren't, but just kind of being aware that this Uranus square is is a coming because, um, yeah, I just think that a lot of our Mars ruled houses have kind of taken a beating um, between eclipses and the retrograde and Mars in fall. So, yeah, we're not quite out of it yet. I don't know if we're ever out of it, but I'm just thinking about that for myself. You know, I got to be aware that 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 square is going to come and still cause some um yeah uh, un instability i guess with with mars ruled houses in order to very much test the stability if you think you've got you know you've got Mar mars handled like that things are in working order there that will certainly test it mm, yeah that's a good point yeah that's a good great way of phrasing that all right. I think that's like the last major thing that we meant to mention in terms of of the forecast for June, right? Is that Mercury Kazemi, if we want to talk about that on the on the 30th. Is that the 30th? Yeah, it's like right on the last day of the month. So there it is on June 30th. Mercury conjoining the sun at eight and nine degrees of cancer, um, where it has a nice trine with Saturn at seven degrees of Pisces and a nice, very nice sextile with Jupiter at nine degrees of Taurus. Um, and that's the beginning of Mercury's synodic cycle where it is Kazemi or it ent enters the heart of the sun. Um, and this looks like a pretty positive one uh, relative to like other ones we've seen over the years. Yeah, you know, when we've talked, we've been talking about uh, in different contexts today, the, the sort of deep sense making of, uh, about things about our role in life and what's happened and all that this this seems like the perfect um moment for that or the, this this natural this configuration seems to naturally lead to like um a workable reflection on where we're at right because it's it's um it's imbibing aspects from both saturn and jupiter right like Oh, the you know these difficulties and this on these ongoing pressures and Jupiter these opportunities or like you know the 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 fields that are beginning to flower over here and you know that Mercury Sun just looking you know um, as we say focusing the attention like Mercury like a lens focusing the light of the Sun you know at this point of like in you know in, intimate reflection even intimate with oneself um, just feels like nice like that's. It's sort of like it, it almost will do the introspection for you or like pull you into that that place of, you know, coming, how should I say, like getting settled with a lot of where where things are, even if Venus is about to, you know, do a bunch of stuff over there. But as far as Saturn, Jupiter um, and, um, you know, the sun are concerned, like there's there's a real like settling um settling and sense making at a deep level there that, that I love that also thinking about how this is our like diurnal team mm -hmm. all kind of aspecting each other from these earth and water signs and it does kind of feel like this blending of the you know mind and body spirit matter um especially because it's a superior Kazemi too and Mercury is like out on the other side of the sun bringing in some intelligence for us yeah, it does feel perfect for that. 
it's making me think of um i've been reading doing research for an episode and doing a lot of reading on like hermeticism and gnosticism and a common word that was super important in those religious and philosophical traditions was the word gnosis um, which means knowledge or knowing as well as the word um, noose was really central in their their theology which means mind and this notion that um that they really focused on which is that each of us has like a spark of um divinity from the original source the divine mind and that uh before birth that spark or our souls like descend through the planetary spheres and we pick up these qualities from each of the planets um that add to our character until eventually we're born and we're incarnated um but while we're here occasionally that we through contemplation and through philosophy and other things that involve the mind we can sometimes like have these glimpses of like our original self or glimpses of some higher truths about the nature of the cosmos through this like internal process of thinking and through this transmission of that knowledge or of knowing um and this uh valens actually says that the sun signifies news so uh this conjunction makes me think of that of the ability to go internally into oneself and to reflect and remember something about who we are at some core level and what we want out of life or what we are here to accomplish um seems like a good moment of like uh, uh for that here when we have such a auspicious Kazemi or conjunction with Mercury sextiling Jupiter and trining Saturn at the same time and finding the balance between those those energies yeah that that tracks I um um uh, I, I often teach the the mercury uh the mercury's conjunction with the sun while direct as um mercury um invisible down here mercury's not on, on not in the earth realm but instead of being invisible because uh it's in the underworld with hades and all the you know tormented souls and lost emails um mercury is up 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 above at the top of mount Olympus, olympus like communing with the gods right that not here the, the the mind is not here but naturally seeking um divine inspiration or divine message and i've definitely had you know some pretty gnosticated moments under the mercury uh, kazemi when it's direct yeah just that that moment of sudden like realization about something uh, where you have that sudden like moment of of clarity about something in your life um, I think all of us experiences that at different points in our life. And it's really weird because suddenly you have this realization or the sudden focus of clarity, uh, which is so different because usually each of us is so focused on our day-to-day -day lives and we're so um, entrenched in the subjective experience of all of these different things that are happening constantly in our lives that to have a true moment of uh, clarity of purpose sometimes stands out as being unique. Yeah, I love a Mercury Kazemi. A nice, good, sweet, sweet clarity. <laughs> it's always really nice. The, uh, the the moment of realization is worth a thousand prayers. I think that's from Natural Born Killers. <laughs> <laughs> it hits. Nice. Um, all right. Well, I think that's a good stopping point then for this forecast for for June. Um, thank you both. This was an awesome and interesting episode where we covered a lot of different things. We talked a lot about this being the sort of precursor to the Venus retrograde and setting up so much stuff that's going to come uh, over the course of the next few months. And I think it was a good good uh, discussion of that and good preparation for some of the things that are developing people's lives over the, the coming weeks and months. Thank you. That yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Um, so Kira, what do you have going on and and what what do you have coming up in the future? What are you working on? Yeah, I'm I'm working I'm working on an app right now, but <laughs> that won't be out for a while. <laughs> um, it's gonna be a dating app, which is cool. But nice. regardless of that, um, I have my podcast, Cosmic Guidance for All. I've been trying to do weekly forecasts. It's been hard while traveling, but um, I'm having a lot of fun doing them. So yeah, weekly forecasts, forecasting your work week and your weekend. Um, and then I also just have my books open for readings in June and 
um, if those get booked up, just get on my mailing list. Uh, I open up every month. So yeah. Nice. And what's your website URL again? Yeah, it's kira.world. Pretty Perfect. easy. Yeah. All right. I'll put a link to that in the description below this video and also on the podcast website for this episode. Uh, Austin, what do you have coming up? Well, I'm um, going to be giving a number of, I'm going to be giving two talks in a workshop at Norwalk next week. Um, so that's the end of May. I guess it's already sold out, so I shouldn't even mention it, but I'll see a bunch of you there. Come say hi, um, which is not just a friendly thing to say, but literally come say hi. Um, I need really need glasses. And so I can't see faces especially if, only, if i've only met you on the internet after about 20 feet you just look like a person who i may or may not know so literally come say hi um and then i hate that uh, so much i've had have you had that experience also if you look you're looking at somebody but you can't really see them and you look away and they think that you're like snubbing them or but you actually you know, just I, kind of... I look like this right and, exactly and like kind of irritated because <laughs> i can't tell you're squinting right at so them. yeah i'm just like giving full double stink eye um <clears throat> but so there's that. And then uh, also uh, by the time this episode is out, Sphere and Sundry will have released uh, its uh, project Magnum Opus. Um, the, <clears throat> the, the, um, their big project. I can't give, uh, I can't give any details. All the details will be made available early morning on the 23rd of May. It's fantastic. It's five years in the making. Um, a number of different elections of mine went into the creation. I can't say any more right now, but, um, you know, if you, um, yeah, I, you, you should absolutely check it out. Um, either <laughs> wake up at three in the morning on, uh, on or early on Tuesday, or, you know, check it when you wait, check spheranscentry.com when you wake up really exciting stuff. I'm very happy for Kate and proud and also excited that it's finally going to be out. Cause again, this has been like a five-year project. So finally awesome. crowning. So exciting. Yeah, that, that's super exciting. Uh, so what are the URL websites again? So I'm austincopic.com and sphere and sundry is sphere and sundry.com. Brilliant. All right. I'll put a link to that in the description below this video. Um, as for myself, uh, things I have coming up, I, I'm, I've just started a clips channel for the astrology podcast on YouTube. So I can take some excerpts of longer ep episodes and just post shorter clips of those. Um, I'll have a link to that. If you just go to the homepage for the astrology podcast on YouTube, you'll see uh, the new channel I have set up for that just called astrology podcast clips. Um, other than that, I'm working on some great episodes coming up. I'm working on a possible episode on Mesoamerican astrology. I also have another separate episode I'm working on on astrology and health. So a lot of good stuff coming up and I'm going to release those for early access through my page on Patreon. So I did want to plug that just because, you know, I hit 400 episodes and um, I'm super happy how far the podcast has come. And I've been super grateful, especially I want to give a shout out and thanks to all the patrons that have supported this work because it's what allows me to generate basically like free classes on astrology that are, go really in depth that I'm able to just release to the public for free. So if you want to support that work, then I would uh, appreciate, you know, if you want to sign up and throw me a few dollars through Patreon, uh, thank you. And thanks to all the patrons that joined us for the live um, show today. There's been a lot of great comments in the live chat of just patrons that joined the live stream. So thanks all for joining and for supporting me over the years, because it's made a huge difference and it's made this work possible. All right. I think that's it for this episode. So thanks both of you for joining me today. Yep. My pleasure. Thanks. All right. Thanks everyone for watching or listening to this episode of the astrology podcast, and we'll see you again next time. A special thanks to all the patrons that helped to support the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, shout out to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Mimi Stargazer, and Jean-Marie Kaplan. If you appreciate the work I'm doing here on the podcast and you'd like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through our page on patreon.com. In exchange, you can get access to bonus content that's only available to patrons of the podcast, such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the monthly forecast episodes, 
our monthly Auspicious Elections podcast, or another exclusive podcast series called the Casual Astrology Podcast, or you can even get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, visit patreon.com slash astrology podcast. If you're looking to get an astrological consultation, we have a list of recommended astrologers at theastrologypodcast.com slash consultations. The astrologers on the list are friends of the podcast that have been featured in different episodes over the years, and they have different specialties such as natal astrology, electional astrology, sinistry, rectification, or horary astrology. You can get a 10% discount when you book a consultation with one of the astrologers on our list by using the promo code ASTROLOGYPODCAST. The astrology software that we use and recommend here on the podcast is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available for the PC at alabe.com. Use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we recommend a software program called Astro Gold for Mac OS, which is from the creators of Solar Fire for PC, and it includes both modern and traditional techniques. You can find out more information at astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount. If you'd like to learn more about my approach to astrology, then I'd recommend checking out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune where I go over the history, philosophy, and techniques of ancient astrology, taking people from beginner up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. You can get a print copy of the book through Amazon or other online retailers, or there's an ebook version available through Google Books. If you're really looking to expand your studies of astrology, then I would recommend my Hellenistic Astrology course, which is an online course on ancient astrology where I take people through basic concepts up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. There's over 100 hours of video lectures as well as guided readings of ancient texts, and by the time you finish the course you will have a strong foundation in how to read birth charts as well as make predictions. You can find out more information at courses.theastrologyschool.com. And finally, thanks to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer Magazine, which is a quarterly astrology magazine which you can read in print or online at mountainastrologer.com.